Senator Miller. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that further proceedings on the roll call be dispensed with and the Sergeant Arms be instructed to bring in the absent members. To that motion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, the motion does prevail. The Secretary will close the roll. Members, please stand for the prayer. Today's chaplain is the Reverend Emily Newton of Cambridge Lutheran Church in Cambridge, Minnesota. And following the prayer, please remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. To the God that calls us, gathers us, loves us, and sends us, I ask you to be at work in the women and men gathered here. Keep at the center of their hearts the peace that you provide that passes all understanding. Where there is strife, create unity. Where there is anxiety, inspire peace. Where there is joy, let us not hesitate to celebrate. All of your people gathered here are called to serve the people they represent. Stir up in each of them your calling for justice, peace, honor, and truth. Amen. The secretary will take the roll. Senators Abler, Anderson, Bach, Benson, Bigham, Carlson, Chamberlain, Champion, Clausen, Coleman, Swazinski, Dames, Dibble, Dornick, Dreheim, Duckworth, Dietzik, Eaton, Eichhorn, Eakin, Fate, Friends, Gazelka, Goggin, Herr, Hoffman, Housley, Howe, Ingerbritson, Isaacson, Jasinski, Johnson, Johnson, Stewart, Kent, Kifmar, Klein, Coran, Kunish, Lang, Latz, Limmer, Lopez, Franzen, Marty, Matthews, McEwen, Miller, Murphy, Nelson, Newman, Newton, Osmick, Pappas, Port, Pratt, Putnam, Rarick, Rest, Rosen, Rude, Senjum, Thomasoni, Torres, Ray, Utke, Weber, Westrom, Weger, Wickland. Pursuant to Rule 14.1, the following members intend to vote under Rule 40.7. Senators Eaton, Eakin, Fateh, and Thomasoni. A quorum is present. Beginning on the fifth order of business, reports the committee. Senator Miller. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the committee reports printed in the addendum be adopted. To that motion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Those opposed, the motion does prevail. Moving to the sixth order of business, second reading of Senate bills. The secretary will read the Senate file numbers. Senate file number 3975. The Senate file has been given its second reading. Moving to the eighth order of business, introduction and fee first reading of Senate bills. The bills on today's introduction calendar are given their first reading and referred as indicated. Moving to the ninth order of business, motions and resolu resolutions. We will adopt the author's motions in one motion. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Those opposed, the motion does prevail. Remaining under motions and resolutions, Senator Miller. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, pursuant to Rule 26, I designate the following bills made for special orders for immediate consideration. Members, the list is on your desk. Members, it's a little loud in here today. I know we're excited about one of the bills, and it's probably Senator Rarick's bill. First bill on the agenda is House File 3620, number 42 on general orders. Senator Rarick. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, um, House File 3620 is a simple bill to help to address some uh, housing needs in Minnesota. Um, manufactured housing can help address some of the needs, and especially for low income. But one of the issues we have is a shortage of installers. There is currently just a few, little over 70 licensed installers, and they are busy doing the new homes. So what this bill does will allow um, the 11,000 general contractors that we have, uh, residential building contractors, to take a three-hour class to be certified so that they can install used houses. And then the other thing that the bill does is currently there is a um, label on a mobile home that is required. This will allow also a data plate. Uh, so if that label happens to have come off 
the data plate that is on the interior of the home will be allowed to identify it. So uh, simply put, that's what the bill is and would appreciate your support. Discussions and amendments to House File 3620. Seeing none, Secretary will give the bill its third reading. House File number 3620, a bill for an act relating to labor and industry. Third reading. Further discussion? Seeing none, Secretary will take the roll on final passages of House File 3620. Calling Senator Jasinski to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Thomasoni votes aye. Thomasoni votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Johnson votes aye. Johnson votes aye. I call Senator Hur to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Hur. Uh, Mr. President, I'd like to report aye for Senator Eaton. Eaton votes aye. Senator Hur. I'd like to report aye for Senator Eakin. Eakin votes aye. Senator Hur. And I'd like to report aye for Senator Fateh. Fateh votes aye. Thank you. Call Senator Hur to vote to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Hur. Uh, Mr. President, I'd like to report yes for Senator Latz. Senator Latz votes aye. All members having voted with the desire to vote, the Secretary will close the roll. There being 66 ayes and no nays, House File 3620 passes in its title agreed to. Number second bill today on special orders is House File 3217, number 32 on general orders, Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, House File 3217 is a provision that the Department of Agriculture brought forward, and it's to ensure that data collected uh, by people that seek mental or behavioral health through the Minnesota Farm and Rural Helpline, uh, that that data is classified as private or non-public. Uh, there is a, under the Minnesota General uh, the Minnesota Government Data Practices Act, there's a general presumption that data collected by the state is public unless there's a law making private. And the Department of Ag brought this up that it would be uh, very important for uh, mental health uh, data by farmers that seek uh, assistance through this helpline uh, that this data be labeled private or non-public. So it was a simple bill passed through the Agriculture Committee and the Civil Law Committee uh, and had very strong support uh, from both sides. And uh, that's my bill, Mr. President, and I believe Senator Westrom has an amendment. Senator Westrom. Mr. President, uh, I would move the A2 amendment. Sen the Secretary will report the amendment. Senator Wester moves to amend House File Number 3217 as follows, page 1 after line 19. Insert, this is the A2 amendment. To the A2 amendment, Senator Westrom. Mr. President, members, uh, I uh, offer the A2 amendment to help respond uh, quickly to our 
avian influenza problem that our poultry farmers are dealing with as we speak. Uh, this is a million dollars to put additional money into the emergency response account for the Department of Agriculture working with the Board of Animal Health to augment or supplement the 400000 that's in the account now, but money that's going to uh, be used and needed in the next days and weeks because the avian flu has hit our state. It has went from nine sites and under 500,000 birds last Friday to today's latest numbers of 21 farms across our state and over a million birds. In less than a week, it's doubled. And so members, it's very unfortunate for our poultry farmers. Avian influenza has been shifting to the west from the east coast and from the south, and it hit the Mississippi Flyway several weeks ago. As the weather has warmed, the birds continue to come for further north, and the migratory uh, flocks have seemingly brought it to our state, and our poultry farmers are devastated if it hits their flocks. Our Department of Agriculture, our Board of Animal Health are on the ground They've asked for this million dollars to uh, get through the next several weeks or a few weeks. With the Easter recess members, I would urge your support for this emergency funding to help respond to the avian influenza that's impacting 11 counties and farmers across the state of Minnesota. Uh, with that, uh, Mr. President, I would stand for any questions. Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. President. I would uh, accept the A2 as a friendly amendment and would urge members support. Senator Murphy. Thank you, Mr. President uh, and members. Uh, this is likely not the last time we will deal with this issue of avian flu uh, yet this spring, uh, but it is moving swiftly uh, as we would expect, as it has uh, across the country, and we need to move as swiftly as the infection to make sure that we're supporting our farmers uh, and getting this under control to the best of our ability. So, uh, Senator Westrom, uh, I stand with you and urge a green vote. Further discussion to the A2 amendment. Seeing none, all those in favor of the amendment signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, motion does prevail. The amendment is adopted. Further discussion to House file. 3217. Seeing none, the secretary will give the bill its third reading. House file number 3217, a bill for an act relating to agriculture. Third reading. Further discussion? Seeing none, the secretary will take the take the vote or take the roll call on 3217 as amended. Call Senator Herr to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Herr. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to report aye for Senator Eaton. Eaton votes aye. Senator Herr. Aye for Senator Eakin. Eakin votes aye. Senator Herr. Aye for Senator Fateh. Fateh votes aye. Senator Herr. And aye for Senator Latz. Latz votes aye. Thank you. Call Senator Jasinski to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Johnson votes aye. Johnson votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Tomasoni votes aye. Tomasoni votes aye. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Rosen votes aye. Rosen votes aye. Senator Jasinski.
All members having voted with the desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 66 ayes and no nays, House File 3217, as amended, does pass. It's title agreed to. Moving to the third and final bill on special orders today, Senate File 3692, number 103 on general orders, Senator Nelson. Thank you, Mr. President. Member Senate File 3692 is the early first omnibus tax bill coming before our body today. Uh, and before we bring forward this tax bill, I do want to thank our dedicated staff who makes this possible. We all know about taxes. We all seem to think that perhaps we may pay too much. Uh, and we all know that they're complicated. Uh, I want to thank our committee staff in preparation of, uh, of our tax bill that we see today. Uh, Brian Steinhoff, our committee administrator, committee legislative assistant, Maddie Howe, research, Daniel Mickelberg, Krista Broughton, and our Senate counsel, Nora Pollock. Chris, uh, Eric Sylvia and our legislative analyst Bjorn Arneson and our fiscal analyst who's keeping all those numbers, Jay Wilms. Uh, so I, I thank staff for their hard work today and I also thank the Minnesota Senate Tax Committee. We've had great hearings about our, tax, our taxes and how they are affecting Minnesotans and um, that is the result of the bill that you, we have before us today. And the Minnesota Senate Tax Committee is focused on good, nimble, fiscal tax policy. And I'm just going to read you a couple adjectives, just share with you, not read with you, adjectives about the good tax policy that the Minnesota Senate Tax Committee has focused on. Good, nimble tax policy is fairness. It's noted for fairness, adequacy, simplicity, neutrality, transparency, and administrative ease. And members, we are focused on tax policy with those hallmarks of good tax policy that will empower Minnesotans and help drive economic growth in our state. And that's the bill that we are bringing before you today, members. The tax relief in this bill uh, is $3.38 billion for fiscal year 2023. And it's $5.04 billion in the tails. The total three-year tax relief in this bill is $8.43 billion. And let's look at this in the light of where we are today. We have over $9.25 billion surplus, largest in state history. Our reserves are full and topped off over $2.5 billion, as is our cash flow account topped off. Members, uh, this bill is a way to return that excess taxation to hardworking Minnesotans who paid uh, those taxes that were more than adequate. Our expenses have been met we know our budget amount has increased, our state budget has increased significantly. It continues to do so. The spending continues to increase, as does our state budget. But now we have an additional $9.25 billion at a time, though, when Minnesotans, many, are feeling a pinch. They're feeling a pinch from rising inflation, over 7.5% rise in inflation. They're seeing their cost to fill up their car, the gas pump, increasing. They're seeing the cost of food, basic food at the grocery stores, increasing. Uh, they are seeing the cost of energy to heat their homes going up by 30%. And so while we sit on $9.25 billion, far too many Minnesotans are struggling with the effects of skyrocketing inflation, historic inflation, 40-year high inflation and particularly Minnesotans on fixed incomes. So this bill focuses on income tax relief for all Minnesotans. If you pay income taxes in the state of Minnesota, this bill is going to give you a reduction in your income taxes. 
And the greater percent of reduction is at the lower income levels. So everyone gets a reduction, but members, in contrast to some proposals uh, about our massive state budget surplus, this is not a one time. This is ongoing permanent tax relief to every Minnesota income tax payer. This bill also eliminates the double taxation on Social Security benefits. Minnesotans bought those benefits year after year, paycheck after paycheck, when they paid those Social Security taxes. And now it almost seems like a slap in the face that when it comes time to retire, Minnesota state government is saying, yes, but we want to tax you on those benefits that you purchased. And we want to tax that uh, as part of your income tax. Well, many, many other states, about 37 of them, have already seen the light and have stopped taxing Social Security income. We are surrounded by states who do not tax Social Security income. Again, Minnesota is an outlier. We are an outlier in how we treat seniors seniors purchased benefits in taxing them, and we are an outlier in our income taxes members. Our lowest income tax rate, that's the lowest rate for Minnesotans who have the most modest incomes, they pay at a lower rate, and of course this bill is looking to nearly slash that rate in half. And yet, our lowest rate members right now is higher than the highest rate of a majority of states in our nation. We can no longer afford to be an outlier in taxation. And this bill is a step to rectifying that. It is a step to getting money back into the pockets of hardworking Minnesotans who best know how to use those, those funds. There are two other ad additional pieces in this bill that I'll speak to briefly. Another place where Minnesota is an outlier. And this has to do with the uh, spousal estate tax portability. Typically, you know, in a, in, a, um, in a marriage, one spouse will die and give all those assets to the remaining spouse. Well, Minnesota is just one of a few states that does not recognize, well, first of all, we're one of a few states which even taxes uh, th with an estate tax anymore. Many states do not, but we do. And in addition, we don't allow the exemption, the exemption for the first death. In other words, we don't allow that to be recognized when the second decedent passes, as many other states do, and as, by the way, the federal government has done for the last decade. It's time that Minnesota conform to this provision as well. It's important to our Minnesota farmers, our Minnesota families trying to uh, stay in our state. Uh, and then lastly, members, there's about $130 million of conformity. And I can see your eyes glazing over when you hear about conformity. Uh, well, that is how our Minnesota tax code lines up with the federal tax code. And Typically, we try to conform a bit each year so that it's easier for Minnesotans to file their taxes so they don't have to file all of these additional Minnesota-only pieces. And we were doing fairly well until there was a large, uh, we've had six major, major federal bills in the last, over the last few years with COVID. And I'll just uh, share with you a few of those. And just so that you know, uh, we are conforming uh, to many of the federal tax provisions uh, in those bills. And you will know, about, you have heard about these, we've talked about them significantly. The Further Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2020, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, of 2020, the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security, or the CARES Act, March of 2020, 
the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021, the American Rescue Plan, uh, March of 2021, and the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, November 15th of 2021. This is unprecedented, members. We have not seen this type of uh, massive uh, federal uh, spending and its taxation increases, likely in our lifetimes. Hopefully we never will again. Uh, and so the conformity items in this bill actually conform to how the federal ta government is treating many of those items that came uh, through those acts. And I'll just mention a few of them that, are on, that I think you've heard much about from your constituents. Uh, shuttered venue grants, uh, not taxing those as income. The idle grants, not taxing those as income. Short sales, indebtedness, not uh, a principal residence, not taxing that as income. And, and some student loan uh, forgiveness as well. Not taxing that as income. Again, we're conforming uh, to the federal government's uh, taxation on those items. These decrease Minnesotans' tax liability. They do not increase Minnesotans' tax liability. And they make for tax filing simpler. Mr. President, members, that is a high-level overview of a fantastic tax bill that is going to help put money back into the pockets of Minnesotans who overpaid about $9.25 billion. Discussion and amendments questions. to Senate File 3692. Senator Klein. Well, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Nelson, for putting forward the bill and sharing with us the Republican vision this year for the finances of the state of Minnesota. I was grateful in particular that Senator Nelson referenced the guiding principle, the first guiding word of our mission statement from the tax committee, which is fairness. Uh, because I think there are several provisions uh, within this bill, which I will point out, that would be obvious to any Minnesotan as grossly unfair. The two major features of the bill are the large income tax break for all filers. Uh, and in that income tax break, $166 million of relief goes to individuals who earn more than $250,000 a year. In the Social Security tax relief portion, $20 million is spent on people over the age of 62 who make more than $500,000 a year. Half a billion dollars is spent on the top 13% of earners every year in our state. At the same time, 543,000 filers, slightly less than one in five filers in the state of Minnesota will receive no tax relief whatsoever from this bill. This morning, the Republican media department sent out a release to the press which contained these statements. The income tax portion of this bill provides the largest benefit for those who make between $150,000 and $250,000 a year. The Social Security cut provides the largest benefit for individuals who make between $250,000 and $500,000 a year. This was sent out by Republican media, which I guess is indicative of the fact that this is a feature rather than a bug of the plan and is their definition of fairness in tax policy. I'd like to compare that with an individual who works here at the Senate, a staffer here at the Senate, young person who makes $42,000 a year currently going to school. By the time that person is done with school, they will owe $100,000 in student loan debt, at which point they will be 27 years old. The bill in front of you provides zero dollars for student loan credits for that young person, zero dollars for K-12 education credits or child care credits, things that would help an ambitious young Minnesotan forward in their path on life. Republicans may point out that under the income tax provision of this bill, that person would get $540 of income tax relief at the end of the year, and I would respond that that is $150 less than if she earned $250,000 a year. It's notable as well that there is nothing in this bill or nothing has been done yet this session for our frontline heroes, the grocers, the grocery workers, the nurses, the certified nursing assistants who got us through this crisis over the last couple of years and are still waiting for our response. Beyond being unfair, this bill is irresponsible with the surplus that we have in front of us. It's pointed out frequently that we do have a very large historic surplus this year, $9.25 billion. However, we should note that for fiscal year 23, we have already spent 
through bills passed through this committee and the bill that's before us today, $4.5 billion on unemployment insurance, reinsurance, and now this tax bill. In the tails through 2025, that will be $9.5 billion. The surplus is spent, and much of it on very affluent people. The money is gone. If you were a Minnesotan who hoped that we would use this historic surplus to address climate change, to rebuild our schools after these difficult couple of years, to address the housing crisis and get homeless people into safe places, if you were hopeful that we would finally reward our heroes and our frontline workers, you will be disappointed in this bill. Mr. President, this bill is neither fair nor responsible, and I urge a no vote. Further discussion? Senator Rest. Thank you, um, Mr. President. Um, I too want to talk about the concepts of fiscal realism that are missing in this bill. It's not about being conservative or liberal, it is about being a realist. And that is what Governor Walz brought to us in uh, his supplemental budget and in his tax programs. He recognizes that we are facing inflation, 6%, that the Fed um, in March um, added a quarter point to um, the borrowing rate, that in May they're likely, they have announced likely to um, add another quarter point, so it'll be a half a point, that um, uh, our agricultural community is still facing a drought, and that has uh, some disastrous effects on, um, uh, on the crops, even though we see in the paper that um, farmers in the last year um, had a, um, a huge increase in their profits. But we all know that, that those kind of profits are fleeting. One season, one season can bankrupt a farming family. Um, right now, if you're going to um, want to buy a house, I bet if you ride around in your neighborhood, you're going to see more homes are still on the market. It used to be they'd be up one day for sale, down the next. That's not happening so much anymore. Why? Because the mortgage rates have gone up to at least 5%. And what that means is that you can't buy as much house in terms of the, uh, the available resources that you have to make a down payment. The first 19 pages of this bill um, sends $75 million approximately to corporations, to business people, uh, or to businesses, <laughs> Uh, 25 million to um, to individuals. Even there, it's three to one, three to one. But that's 19 pages. The billions are in the last five pages in this very very small bill. But 19 pages is all conformity that we should have done before. The heart of this bill is the last five pages. Governor Waltz, in his caution, has proposed that we, instead of spending a billion dollars every year or every two years, unsustainable in the tails, that we send out now, so they have it now, within the, within the next few months, um, they're going to have extra dollars to pay for um, increased energy costs. All of our bills are going up for energy costs. Um, our grocery bills are going up, affected by inflation. And, um, 
And this permanent tax cut, well, when, when will that actually be seen? Will that be seen um, before the end of the year in a measurable way? Or would you rather have $1,000 for your family of three or four to be able to pay for groceries for an entire month? an entire month. It's not chump change. It is not chump change to get a direct payment that is not taxable in Minnesota, not taxable in Minnesota, tax-free in Minnesota, $1,000 to spend for your family's needs right now. Not this promise, not this, this uh, guarantee on a permanent tax cut for the rich. They will get a guarantee. And when I say rich, I don't mean, I don't mean uh, maybe, but maybe a couple of people in here. This bill will affect you. And we know that what's happening um, in that housing market is affecting our local governments, the way in which they provide for um, the citizens in our cities and counties and other uh, property tax jurisdictions. And guess what's going to happen to the property taxes? They're going to go sky high, just like they did when we did this about a decade ago. Big tax break. And then we had a series of deficit after deficit after deficit, increases in property taxes every single year until Mark Dayton, Governor Mark Dayton, came along and said, this is going to stop. And we finally really affirmed a, uh, a progressive income tax system by, um, by coming up with a fourth tier and by asking the very high income people to pay fair taxes. Like Senator Nelson and Senator Klein said, that is the very first mission of the tax committee um, and should be actually something perhaps that's, that's in our uh, Constitution. Taxes in this state will be fair. So Governor Walz um, proposes that we have um, some direct payments, $1,000. $1,000 to everybody uh, who uh, filing a married filing joint, $500 for individuals, and, um, and it recognizes that even though you don't pay income taxes, some of these sheets, I mean, you only deal with income taxes, but you know people who don't pay income taxes, they pay sales tax. They pay sales tax and they pay property tax either directly on their homes or through their rent. So when we talk about, well, they don't pay taxes anyway, so, so what? Um, they do pay taxes and they should be recognized for their contribution to our, um, our economic well-being because they indeed do pay um, uh, sales tax and property tax. So, um, uh, Mr. President, I want to um, offer the A-16 amendment. The Secretary will report the A-16 amendment. Senator, Senator Ress moves to amend Senate file number 3692 as follows, page 22, delete section 5. This is the A-16 amendment. Senator Rest. Thank you very much. So, the, uh, Mr. President, so, what the A-16 does is get the money out the door right now while we have it, while all of these other things that can bring us down, cause us to be even more cautious, are, um, are still held in abeyance. We're uncertain about war. We know that even if our young men and women uh, participate in a worldwide war, or don't participate in a worldwide war, they still, um, our economy, their families, are going to be um, affected by it. What this does is to give, again, more money to more people. They get it now 
in this current coming up fiscal year and not later. Everyone except the wealthiest Minnesotans under this amendment are guaranteed $1,000 per couple, 500 per single filers, in order to get $1,000 from the Republican plan, you have to be earning more than $100,000, and over 2 million people don't earn that. We are not a state of hundreds of thousands of millionaires. The other thing about this is, in the Republican plan, people who don't even live here, they don't even live here, they don't contribute really to here, get a break. Governor Walz's direct payments bill um, goes only to Minnesotans. Only to Minnesotans. Instead of to the 265,000 people that don't even live here. The DFL plan that I'm presenting here that is Governor Walz's doesn't exclude a half a a million working Minnesotans. Under the Republican plan, a half a million Minnesotans get no tax cut um, because, again, they don't earn enough to even get on the chart, even though they pay sales tax, and it's a high sales tax because we have local sales taxes as well, and certainly um, property taxes. We are sending out, in this proposal, uh, two billion. So theirs is 2.8 billion. Governor Walz's direct payments program um, is two billion, and it's going out now, between now and the end of this fiscal year in uh, 2023. The rebates, the direct payments, whatever you want to call them, what's in a name? <laughs> Um, are fiscally responsible, and they're fiscally realistic, and, um, and they will keep us from years, I believe, and I am convinced, of uh, increases in property taxes and um, that we saw in the um, early years of, of this uh, of this of this century, and it will keep us um, fiscally solvent, and again, represents an attitude toward our fiscal, uh, our fiscal health of being realistic. Uh, Mr. President, I request a roll call on my Roll end. call is requested, roll call granted. Senator Nelson. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Well, I stand in opposition to this amendment. And, you know, I believe that Minnesotans can do basic math. And they understand the difference between a one-time check and ongoing year-after-year year tax reductions. So this is, and, and let me just say, uh, even the uh, DFL-controlled House of Representatives understands that, and uh, the governor's walls checks are nowhere to be found in the DFL tax bill. And you know what, members? They don't belong in our Senate tax bill either. I think it's insulting to think that Minnesotans uh, would prefer a one-time check as opposed to ongoing tax reform, ongoing tax relief. And then I just want to address a few other comments that were made earlier that really are, are just not accurate. I hope you have this sheet on your desk that talks about tax effectiveness. So the effective tax rate by income level. So, and this is by the deciles of taxpayers in our state. And you can see that the first two deciles and our most modest incomes, they don't pay any income tax. But they do get refundable income tax credits 
They do get credits on taxes they don't pay in the state of Minnesota because we care about Minnesotans. We want to help all Minnesotans afford life and be able to and empower them to be able to thrive, not just survive. So the lower two deciles um, do not pay any income tax. And to this point then, that um, they would not get tax relief, well they don't pay income taxes, but it, they would get increased um, refundable tax credits. Uh, but most importantly, let's look at the deciles, the third, 20,000 to 30,000 or through the 11th decile, 500,000 or more. I want you to look at that. That top decile um, sees a de decrease of 1% under this tax proposal. People in the third decile see a 100% decrease, 100%. All of their income taxes are gone. The people in the fourth decile would see a 56% cut in their income taxes. So I won't read the rest of the chart for you, but you will see that this income tax proposal, this income tax rate reduction, is aimed at the first tier, those Minnesotans of most modest means, those hardworking Minnesotans. We are giving them tax reductions. I also want to um, dissuade this idea that this is money that is going uh, to the wealthy. Let's be sure that uh, the income tax rate reduction percent decreases dramatically as, one as one's incomes go up. And that is right square in line with Minnesota's progressive tax system. We are one of the most progressively taxed uh, systems in our country, which means the more you make, the more you pay. This tax proposal is providing direct relief to Minnesotans on an ongoing permanent tax basis. And I think Minnesotans can do the math just like the DFL House did, just like the Senate did. Uh, let's provide ongoing permanent tax relief. I encourage a no vote on the A16 amendment. Senator Bach. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Would Senator yes Rest yield for a question? She will. Senator Bach. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. S Senator Rest, do you know, and I haven't been able to cross-reference -re everything in your amendment yet, do you know if these direct payments, which I think you said total about $2 billion, do you know if they're subject to, if, if re recipients of them are going to be subject to pay federal income taxes on the stipend that they receive? Senator Rest. Um, uh, uh, Mr. President and uh, Senator Bach, the uh, direct payments would not be taxable in Minnesota. However, if we want to give them um, to, um, if we want to give them and not give them to um, the very wealthy, um, the federal government would disallow that and they would have to be, they are taxable at the federal level. Uh, when we've done this before, we were able to uh, machine the payments, if you will, so that that did not happen. But um, unless you give everybody the same amount and you give it to everyone, which we do not want to do, um, the, um, uh, these direct payments indeed will be taxable at the federal level, but not, at, not in Minnesota. Senator Bach. Well, M Mr. President, when the governor first came out with his proposal, I contacted the governor's office and asked them if under his proposal these direct payments to people were going to be taxable for federal income tax purposes. And they said, well, yeah, we, we couldn't figure out a way to do it where the federal government wasn't going to tax it. Senator Rest, you and I were here in 1999. And uh, the, those checks that were fondly referred to as Jesse checks, there is a way to do direct payments to individuals without having to pay federal income taxes. So, and Senator Rest, you and I both know that. There's a way to do that because we did it before and it met the test. It wasn't a Minnesota creation. 
Back then it had done, been done earlier in the state of Colorado. That's where we got the idea. There's a way to craft that, but I would say, Senator Rest, your proposal and the governor's proposal are pretty badly flawed. And when Minnesotans find out that they get a check for $500 and they find out that they've got to add it to their federal income tax return and pay maybe at the low end 15% income taxes on it, uh, many Minnesotans are going to pay 20% income taxes on it and, and, and many will pay more than that. So at the generous end of it, this $2 billion, somewhere north of $300 million of it is going to be going to the federal government. I, I would argue, I think most Minnesotans don't want to spend our, our surplus that way, sending such a big portion of it to the, the federal government. I certainly don't want to. I know for a fact my sons don't want to because I don't, I don't have to ask them to know that because we've already had this conversation. So, Senator Rest, as we, as we, if we, as we move forward, if, if this is, and I heard Senator uh, Nelson say that it's not in the, the House tax bill, not right now at least yet, but uh, I would uh, offer a little counsel to the governor if he's really going to dig in and want to do something on this in the end, assuming there's going to be some kind of a tax bill work on a proposal that doesn't send hundreds of millions of dollars of our state budget surplus to the federal government. That, Senator Rest, is the best advice that, that I can give uh, going forward. I think it's a, it's a, I, I think you're well-intentioned, Senator Rest, but I think it's pretty badly flawed by the fact that the federal government is going to get such a big piece of the revenue that we're going to appropriate. Senator Rest. Uh, thank you. Then, Senator Bach, what a softball to me. Thank you so much. If you would like to go on uh, Senate File 3573, which is my bill, which I requested a hearing on and did not get, it indeed is, is um, based on the um, Colorado plan that we used uh, during the uh, governorship of, uh, of, um, uh, of Governor Ventura. And, and here, were the, um, here were the choice points. The Jesse checks went to everybody. That's what kept them non-taxable at the uh, federal level and in Minnesota. They were based on a um, hypothetical sales tax um, burden. The only way this year that that could have happened is if everybody got it and we had a uh, program based on um, assumed sales tax liability. So there it is on one hand. Do we want to give it to the rich in order to give it to everyone else and not have it taxable? Or do we keep it away from the rich and give it to everyone else and have it taxable, absolutely, at the federal level, $500 to people who otherwise wouldn't be paying taxes, and probably on that $500, they're not going to pay any federal income tax either, but it definitely will not be taxable at the, um, uh, at the, uh, at the state level. So that idea is already there. What did I say? 3573. I believe I'm the only author on it. You want four more people to endorse what Senator Bach just said? And I'm sorry, Mr. President, I should not be turning. I apologize. Um, and I shouldn't be pointing my finger. I apologize. <laughs> um, but that set of ideas was right in front of us, 3573. Uh, we could have done it that way. If we wanted to give even more money uh, to rich people, rather than tone it down, be realistic, give people the opportunity to buy groceries, to pay their heating bill for one month out of the next 12. That, again, is not chump change, Mr. President. That's real money to the people that live in my neighborhood. In my neighborhood, that's real money. 
And when they get those checks, in this day and age, not in the 2000s, there was a different world there. We're facing uh, climate destruction. We're facing inflation. Well, back then, we had inflation as well. But we also, um, we weren't facing the global effects of the war against Ukraine. So the opportunity was there. You could do one or the other in order to make direct payments that can not thrust us into huge, um, uh, huge property tax increases over the next several years. Um, I don't believe <laughs> that 3573 or that the A16 amendment is flawed, Mr. President. I believe the um, Senate Republicans tax bill is where it's flawed. And it's not just flawed in the uh, amount of money. Um, I believe that Minnesotans have a different set of values with regard to the way in which all Minnesotans should participate and benefit from this surplus that we are finding so difficult to come to agreements on. Um, thank you, Mr. President. Senator Miller. Thank you, Mr. President. Has a roll call been requested on the amendment? Yes, Senator Miller, thank we're you. under a roll call. Senator Bach. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. President, and, and uh, my, my friend, Senator Rest, you and I have been around tax policy a long time, and uh, I think I know quite a bit about it, and you might be the only person in this room that knows more about it than I do. Uh, and those of you that don't know, when I was first elected to the House back a long, long time ago, Senator Rest was the, was the tax chair, and I was on her, on, on her committee, and I have deep respect for her. And Senator Rest, I'm, I'm not surprised that you have a bill that mirrors what we did back in 1999 uh, whatever the number is, because I have one too. Uh, because when I saw the governor's proposal and learned from the Department of Revenue that people were going to have to pay income taxes on their direct payment, I thought, what, what a poor proposal this is. So uh, I crafted one myself. Not that I think it's a good idea, because I think it was a bad idea back when we did it under Governor Ventura. We should have spent all that money on upgrading our schools with technology or some other purpose uh, than we did. So thinking that if the governor really, really wants to get this, governors often get much of what they want, uh, then somebody better have a proposal that's not so badly flawed that we're going to send hundreds of millions of dollars to the federal government. So Senator Rest, I have a bill too. It's on my desk. Uh, I haven't introduced it <laughs> yet, but and, and what mine actually is, is it goes back to the end of the last biennium and it takes a look at what was really the real surplus at the end of the last biennium. And because that money is in the bank, in the state's checkbook, and it's $4 billion. So at the end of the last biennium. So that's what my bill spends, uh, $4 billion. Uh, I didn't introduce it because I don't think it's a very good idea. But as we get to the end, uh, to those negotiating the final conclusion to this, if the governor decides to really, really dig in, if, uh, if he really thinks this is good tax policy, which I, I don't happen to think so, but if he really thinks that it is, uh, I've got some language on my desk that would make his proposal much better than it is if we find ourselves in a situation of, of having to, to do something on it. So Senator Rest, it's a little interesting that you and I have kind of taken a parallel track on how we can make the governor's proposal better, but unfortunately the provision in front of us is not crafted that way, the, the way that Senator Rest's bill is crafted or the one that, that I have. So. Uh, uh, my good friend, Senator Rest, I think it's flawed. I think probably people should, should vote no on it, and uh, we should come back someday with a proposal that's, uh, that doesn't send hundreds of millions of dollars to the federal government of our surplus. Senator Gazelka. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, uh, first of all, I, I'm glad that uh, Senator Rest caught the finger wagging. I, I was concerned uh, for a second that there might be a cookie on the desk, but. Uh, <laughs> Just saying. But no, uh, members, uh, I'm opposed to this amendment. Uh, it really takes away 
from what we're actually trying to do. And we're trying to change the tax code. We're one of the top five or six tax states in the country. And so I appreciate what Senator Nelson brought forward, uh, actually lowering the lowest income tax so that we're our lowest income tax is higher than the highest income tax rate in 17 states, at least. And so this takes away from the opportunity to do that. And if you ask the taxpayer, would you prefer one time getting around $1,000, or would you prefer every year that you're going to get a similar tax cut every year? And I think the average taxpayer is going to say, we want permanent tax cuts. And so that's what that lowering the lowest income tax rate does for everybody that's paying taxes. And I'll talk about the Social Security income tax later, uh, Mr. President, but we can't do that. We can't do this one-time option. We need to have ongoing permanent tax cuts, and way, the way this tax bill is structured, it really helps everyone. Thank you. Senator Nelson. Thank you, thank you, Mr. President. And just uh, before we uh, leave this provision, I do want to read into the record the effective tax rate by income tax level that the bill in its current form proposes, not the uh, one-time piece in this uh, amendment. But just to be clear, people making under $30,000 a year receive a 100% tax cut. Those making uh, up to 50,000 receive a 56% reduction in, in income taxes. Those making up to 75,000 receive a 32% cut. Those making 75 to 100,000 receive a 26% cut. And you can see as it goes down, uh, 125 to 150,000, they get an 18% reduction. 150 to 250, a 12%. 250 to 500, a 5%. And over 500%, a 1% reduction, folks. So this is weighted to providing the greatest tax relief to Minnesotans of the most modest means. This is fair. And it's clear our budget surplus is more than adequate. So I encourage a no vote on the A-16. Seeing no further discussion, the secretary will take the roll on the amendment. I call Senator Hur to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Hur. Thank you, Mr. President. For 40.7, I'd like to report aye for Senator Eaton. Eaton votes aye. Senator Hur. Aye for Senator Eaton. Eaton votes aye. Senator Hur. And nay for Senator Fateh. Fateh votes no. I call on Senator Lang to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Lang. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Senator Johnson votes no. Johnson votes no. Senator Lang. Senator Thomasoni votes no. Thomasoni votes no. Senator Lang. Senator Rosen votes no. Rosen votes no. Senator Jasinski votes no. Senator Jasinski votes no. Senator and Lang. Senator Goggin votes no. Goggin votes no.
All members having voted with the desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 25 ayes and 41 nays, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. Senator Murphy. Thank you, Mr. President. We have um, seen this movie before, and it had a, a pretty bad ending for Minnesotans. Uh, when I look at the eye popping surplus, and if not every Minnesotan would know the number, but those who are following along uh, with this session understand that there's a surplus uh, in our state budget of $9.25 billion. But if you dig underneath that number uh, structurally, it's a $5.6 billion surplus and predicted, projected $6 billion in the next biennium. So there's money there, but it's not that full $9.25 billion that we keep talking about. Um, past legislatures, when they have faced a surplus like this one, made ongoing commitments uh, that exceeded projections and it drove deficits uh, in the decade that followed, which really hurt people and communities across the state. And when the legislature had to repair those deficits, uh, they often reverted to gimmicks in the budgets like school shifts and budget shifts and removing inflation from our forecasting to make the budget look like it balanced, which is our constitutional obligation when it really didn't. Uh, those were difficult times when you think about budget integrity, fiscal integrity, and they were difficult times for Minnesotans, especially in the Great Recession that began back in 2008. Between the tax bill that is on the floor today and a myriad of other bills that have been heard, including two that we heard this morning, or I think it was three, that cut another $3 billion in ongoing revenue in property taxes, uh, we are well beyond the 5.6 or $6 billion in structural surplus. Um, I think that's real trouble for us when we look ahead. And while we are going to be done with our work uh, in May, uh, another legislature is going to come back next January and face the music of whatever decisions that we're making now. I think the Republican majority is spending money right now like teenagers who have just earned their first paycheck. We're not thinking enough long term. We're not thinking enough about what families need or what communities need, not really. And it explains, at least for me, why, why the majority thus far has only been able to propose $30 million for our public schools and our students and our families. Uh, we know that the work that we do in this body uh, is a reflection of our values and our priorities for Minnesotans. And I want very much for us to be thinking about more than this May or this next November and about Minnesotans, what they've contended with over the last couple of years, and how we work together to meet the moment for them and for our future. And for that reason, I believe that this proposal today is flawed for certain. Um, and I think it is going to create fiscal trouble for the state of Minnesota and Minnesotans uh, down the line, which is why I don't support it. I also believe that there is enough in the structural surplus to help uh, senior citizens and to help uh, families, uh, especially families with students in school or with dependent care expenses. And that's why I'd like to offer for you now the A7 amendment. Uh, Mr. The Secretary President. will report the amendment. Senator Murphy moves to amend House file numbers 3692 as follows, page 21, line 27. This is the A7 amendment. To the A7 amendment, Senator Murphy. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President. The A7 amendment uh, advances cuts in Social Security but it targets it to those seniors that earn less than $120,000 a year. And Mr. President, I have an amendment to that amendment, and that is the A9 amendment. The Secretary will report the amendment. Senator Murphy moves to amend, to amend the Murphy Amendment to Senate File Number 3692 as follows. Page 1, after line 1, insert. This is the A9 amendment. 
To the A9 amendment, Senator Murphy. Thank you, Mr. President, and I'd request a roll call on this amendment. Roll call is requested, roll call granted. Senator Murphy. So you will see uh, in this A9 amendment the representation of two different proposals that have bipartisan support in this legislature. One, the K-12 education credit that provides up to $1,000 tax credit per child to help education-related expenses. This is something that's already in law, but we haven't adjusted the cap in like 25 years. It would increase a computer allowance from $200 to $300. It would allow monthly internet service charges to be an eligible expense to qualify for the credit. And it would increase income eligibility that hasn't been adjusted in 25 years, allowing more working Minnesotans to qualify. And the second part, the Minnesota Dependent, credit, care, Dependent Care Credit helps families who have expenses related to child care or personal care needed for a dependent. This amendment is based off a bipartisan bill. It allows taxpayers to claim up to $3,000 of eligible dependent care expenses per child, provides a larger benefit to parents of young children under the age of five, $7,000 for one child, $14,000 for two, and $19,000 for qualifying with three qualifying children. This would help about 156,000 filers this year with an average tax cut of $1,300. I remember as a young kid, and my family was not a family of means, and I would go to the grocery store with my mother and carry a calculator with me while she put the groceries into the cart um, so that she knew when she got to the checkout counter that there was enough cash in her wallet because that's how she paid for her groceries. And she didn't want to be embarrassed. And I remember, especially during the Great Recession, what it was like not to have enough money because my, my husband's small business was so impacted that we weren't sure we were going to be able to meet our bills. Minnesota's families, they are struggling. We should be thinking about them and the ways that we can be helping them with their expenses. We should be putting more money into the pockets of working families across the state of Minnesota, and my amendment does that. I'd ask for your support. Thank you. Senator Nelson. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. President. And um, as noted, uh, when we discuss this bill, there you will see there are no aids and credits uh, in this tax bill. There are no property tax relief items in this tax bill. As I mentioned, this tax bill is uh, laser focused on those four provisions uh, that I uh, talked to you about. Uh, conformity, uh, state tax portability, income tax, uh, reducing that first tier income tax relief and social security, not uh, ending the double taxation on social security. So uh, the I can tell members that there is a second tax bill coming, which has a number of the provisions brought to the floor today. However, uh, I would encourage uh, um, a no vote uh, at this point. Uh, because uh, there is more to come. I encourage members to look at the bill in front of them, uh, amend uh, that as they see fit. Uh, we look forward to those amendments. Uh, I'm not, uh, Mr. Chair, I, I do wonder about the germaneness uh, of this uh, amendment only because these items, uh, tax, tax aids and credits are not uh, in this tax bill, so it is uh, a bit um, perhaps of a su substantially uh, different or enlarging the tax bill as, as narrowly crafted. But I think uh, in order to uh, save t time from the body, I will just ask for a no vote at this time on, on these particular proposals, knowing that uh, better things uh, along this line are coming in the future. Senator Gazelka. Mr. President, just quickly, um, why do we not want to get rid of all of the tax on Social Security income? Because if you talk to seniors, I don't care if they're low income, middle income, upper income, all of them say, we just want to get rid of it. We want clarity. We don't want to mess around with it. Uh, some of those that are on the lower income have some of their friends that have left the state. We, and this should be our top priority, is getting rid of the tax on Social Security income once and for all. We have an opportunity to do it. We want to do what almost the vast majority of other states have done, just get rid of it. So I'm a no vote. 
Senator Murphy. Um, well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I would urge a green vote on my amendment to the amendment. As I said, there is enough in the surplus to help seniors who are struggling and families with school and dependent care expenses. Uh, it's time to put some money into the pockets of Minnesotans. This is targeted, uh, and it's future-looking, it's future-forward, uh, and that's why it earns your support. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, the Secretary will take the roll on the A-9 amendment. I call on Senator Herr to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Herr. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to report aye for Senator Eaton. Eaton votes aye. Senator Herr. Aye for Senator Eaton. Eaton votes aye. Senator Herr. And aye for Senator Fateh. Fateh votes aye. Thank you. Call on Senator Lang to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Lang. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Senator Johnson votes no. Johnson votes no. Senator Lang. Thomasoni votes no. Thomasoni votes no. Senator Lang. Senator Rosen votes no. Rosen votes no. Senator Lang. Senator Jasinski votes no. Jasinski votes no. Senator Lang. Senator Goggin votes no. Goggin votes no. All members having voted with the desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 32 ayes and 34 nays, the motion does not prevail. The amendment to the amendment is not adopted. Senator Dietzik. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I have the A14 amendment. Senator Dietzik moves an amendment to the amendment A14. The secretary will report the amendment. Senator Dietzik moves to amend the Klein or the, uh, the Murphy amendment to Senate file number 3692 is as follows, page one after line 15, insert. This is the A14 amendment. Senator Dietzik. Thank you, Mr. President. This uh, amendment um, 
This amendment adjusts the Minnesota Student Loan Tax Credit. We have heard, and many of you have heard from students across the state, on the crushing amount of student debt they have to get through college. It is impacting what they do after they get out of college. It is impacting where they live, what job they take, do they have a car, can they buy a house. It is impacting our future workforce. And so this amendment tweaks that tax credit to, um, right now it's at $500, and it increases the credit to $5,000, and it ups the um, adjusted gross income that where the cap is, so that um, up to 100,000, and so it, it gives more people um, the ability to take the credit. And I think um, this helps Minnesota students. We are, we are hearing from workers, and we are hearing from employers that they want educated workers, and our educated workers are in school. They are getting all this debt, but it is impacting their, going, their life going forward, and I think this amendment will truly help them in this bill. Um, and I ask for a green vote. Senator, Senator Dietzik. Thank you, and I ask for a roll call. Roll call requested, roll call granted. Senator Nelson. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, again, the bill before us does not deal with the other issues brought forward here. Uh, there is a second tax bill that we will be seeing after spring break. Um, I would encourage a no vote uh, on this at, at this time. I do not believe it is necessary uh, to um, reduce the uh, tax relief uh, in this bill in order to provide the provisions that uh, Senator Dietzig mentions. I encourage a no vote today. Continued discussion to the amendment to the amendment A14, Senator Clausen. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, educational attainment has always been a central value for Minnesotans, and it's also been a means to a better life. But unfortunately, this has not been true today for many of our higher education graduates in Minnesota. We're paying 500 to 1,000 or more per month to pay back student loans. And I want to expand upon uh, Senator Klein's earlier comment. He referenced here a person that works in the Senate who's working here and also obtaining some, a degree. And he mentioned that over $100,000 uh, is probably going to be the student debt that this person is taking on. Well, let's look at the situation in Minnesota. And this is, you can't get any more current information than what I'm going to provide, because this is a report that was just turned out this week, and it was a comparison of states across the United States. And here's some of the statistics for Minnesota. 70% of Minnesota graduates carry student loan debt. Minnesota college graduates average $33,604 or $26.5 billion in student debt carried by students here in Minnesota. Over 788,000 students, that's 14% of our total population in Minnesota, are paying on student loans. Over half of those would be eligible for the tax credit that's being offered by Senator Dietzik. And of the 788,000 plus Minnesotans with student debt, 57.8% are under the age of 35. So these are people that are starting their life, so to speak. These are people that are maybe newly married. These are people that are currently taking on uh, their first employment, and they're burdened with student debt. If uh, you have a chart that was just passed out, I'd like to reference this in my comments here. The handout that's been distributed provides a graphic summary of student debt in Minnesota. It shows the average cumulative debt by degree earned, that's on the upper portion of that document, and the percent of graduates with debt by degree earned, which is in the bottom portion of that document. And the data indicates, if you look at that, there is a trend, there's a trend line that's emerging 
that the percent of graduates with debt is moving slightly downward. We're talking about one or two percentage points for those earning certificates, associates, and bachelor degrees. Those are the, the three, uh, well, the numbers two, three, four from the, the left column. I think this is really a reflection of the investments that we've made as Minnesotans in our Minnesota Student Grant Program over the years, where we've tried to move that up into the middle class so that more students and families are available for that. We've tried to freeze tuition. We've had changes to the 529 uh, plan, college savings plan. And then, of course, we've had many individual efforts by students to reduce their personal debt. However, as the 2022 data indicates that was released this week, over 788,000 Minnesotans, 14% of our population, have educational student debt. And that's having an impact. The A14 amendment sends a message that higher education is a good investment. And as a state, Minnesota is willing to help students to guarantee their future and the economic future of our state. The student loan income tax credit increases the ability of those with student debt to participate in the economy as consumers because they'll have additional spending available to them. The student loan income tax credit allows graduates to purchase homes, goods and services, resulting in increased economic activity for our state, which is a return on investment for that tax credit investment through paid taxes and fees. So the A14 amendment is a good investment in Minnesota workforce. It's also, and that also guarantees, I think, the economic future of Minnesota and Minnesota's families. So thank you, Mr. President. Senator Dietzik. Thank you, Mr. President. We often hear that seniors are leaving the state due to the Social Security issue, but when you talk to the demographer, the largest group leaving the state are, are young people ages 20 to 24. So this bill with Senator Murphy's amendment, underlying amendment, will help seniors and it will help these young employees. It will hopefully get them to come here to Minnesota. This is an employee recruitment and intention bill for Minnesota. Vote. So with that, I ask for a green vote. Seeing no further discussion, the secretary will take the roll on the amendment to the amendment A14. Call on Senator Hur to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Hur. Mr. President, I'd like to report aye for Senator Eaton. Eaton votes aye. Senator Hur. Aye for Senator Eaton. Eaton votes aye. Senator Hur. And aye for Senator Fateh. Fateh votes aye. Thank you.
Call Senator Lang to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Lang. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Johnson votes no. Johnson votes no. Senator Lang. Senator Thomasoni votes no. Thomasoni votes no. Senator Lang. Senator Rosen votes no. Rosen votes no. Senator Lang. Senator Jasinski votes no. Jasinski votes no. Senator Lang. Senator Goggin votes no. Goggin votes no. All members having voted with the desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 32 ayes and 34 nays, the amendment to the amendment A14 is not adopted. Senator Murphy. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to withdraw the A7 amendment. The A7 amendment is withdrawn. Senator Abler, to the bill. To the bill. Um, well, thank you, I really appreciate the discussion and I have uh, Mr. President, I have a little bit to offer on a tax bill, uh, not much, so I won't spend much time saying it, but, um, you know, somebody had mentioned, I'm not supposed to say names, uh, somebody mentioned fiscal uh, realism, and, you know, I don't know if people realize Minnesota is the number eight state that people leave, and one reason they leave is because of this very topic, Social Security, which I have been promising my people I'd work on for over two decades. So I'm glad to have a chance to finally do this. And I celebrate the fact that we can help everybody not pay a social security tax in Minnesota. Yes, even the people who make some money. Why is that, Mr. President? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because those people can move. You know, a lot of people here, we're, I'm just a working stiff. There's no way I can pack up my stuff very readily and leave and go to the state of my choice. But some people do make choices based upon that. And even for small amounts of money, and I don't know if my mom's watching today, but my own mother never voted for me. Why is that, even though I had her district? Because in 1998, they moved to become Florida residents to save like $4,000. And at least they didn't vote for my opponent. That was the good news. <laughs> but Mr. President, um, people make these decisions. A lot of people you know are no longer part of the Minnesota economy for 49% of the year. Now, they don't buy groceries here. They might want to be here for, like, be gone only three or four months, which is my mom's situation. Now she has to be gone for um, half a year and one day. And so they don't go to the grocery store. They don't take a part-time job as a senior. They don't greet at Walmart. They don't help at a nursing home. And they don't become part of our grandkids' lives as much. And so I think it's a great idea to do this. And I think when you say that we should... Uh, that that they're not leaving for this reason. That's just simply preposterous. And, um, they, and just one thing else, Mr. President, like they're moving to South Dakota, Iowa, Texas, and Florida. And, and just, I, so actually, just as I plea, don't make people move to Iowa, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Clausen. Thank you, Mr. President. I can't resist responding to Senator Abler's uh, comments because the largest group of Minnesotans leaving the state every year are almost 15,000 high school graduates that are leaving the state to go elsewhere for their higher education. And that should be a concern to all of us. Further discussion to Senate File 3692, Senator Friends. Well, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, members. Senator Clausen, I can't resist either. Senator Abler, the census just told us that Minnesota's population growth in the last 10 years was 7.4% higher than the national average. The question is not just who's moving to where it's a little bit warmer. The question is who's staying to raise a young family in our outstanding schools. But that is not the point, Mr. President. Members of the majority party, I have your bill here. Uh, I guess you don't like the direct rebates to taxpayers. I'm uh, encouraged by some of the talk about the structural future of this state. And here's my question for you, Senator Nelson. 
Why are we proposing permanent tax cuts when we don't have a permanent surplus? We're telling the people of Minnesota we're going to cut your taxes permanently, but we're not telling them what we're going to cut from the budget. We're not saying in 2026 we're going to cut teachers or we're going to cut transportation or we're going to cut state government or we're going to cut the pay of state workers. We're just saying we're going to do the part where we cut your taxes without telling them the responsible thing. You wouldn't run your family that way. I don't know why we should say that the state of Minnesota should run its budget that way. I was encouraged yesterday in the Rules Committee by comments by Senator Bach, my colleague from Cook, who said in discussing another proposal, we should be careful to maintain flexibility of future legislatures. And I think that's exactly what we're talking about here. We have a temporary surplus. Permanent tax cuts are probably not the most responsible or conservative way for us to budget. So what could we do? How did we get here? We got here without any changes to the tax rate. We got here because, Mr. President, as you know, in 2021, our projections were record high personal income, record high corporate income, and record high sales tax. That's where the state of Minnesota is right now. So the question is, what are we going to do about it? Well, I can tell you one thing we're apparently not going to do about it today is provide targets for some of these jurisdictions that are badly needed. Just today, I heard from my good friends, Senator Senjum and Senator Rarick, say in the Finance Committee to DFL amendments that were defeated, yeah, this is a good idea, but we don't have the target. Although I have to admit, Mr. President, they did not use the word target. My point is, members, there's a smarter way to budget. Most Minnesotans don't talk about conformity, and nobody in North Mankato this year has asked me about the effective tax rate. But what they have said is, hey, you got a big surplus. Who's getting the benefit of it? And I talk about the various proposals, and I say I think we should try to help working men and women. And so, uh, Senator Nelson, to your bill, here's what I see. You're leaving about 500,000 Minnesotans out. Who are those 500,000? They're the 500,000 Minnesotans who file taxes but do not have that tax liability. Who are they? They're the young, the working poor, the single mother with two kids. She gets nothing out of this bill. Now, how are we going to tell those people, yeah, we had $9 billion, and you're still starting out and trying to make a living, but you get zero out of this bill? I don't think that's smart budgeting, and I think the state's fairly strong economic situation has to do with our emphasis as a state on building the economy from the bottom up and from the middle out. That's what we're doing is we're helping the working men and women, the people that need it. Uh, I have a resident in my district, a neighbor named Glenn Taylor, nicest man you're ever going to meet, uh, started a company out of nothing, built it to thousands of employees. I don't even want to know his net worth or his annual income, but I know he owns the Timberwolves. He doesn't need that $1,000 as much as the janitor working 35 hours at South Central needs it. We can do more good by providing that to the janitor, and that's exactly what this bill does not do. Therefore, Mr. President, I propose the A13 amendment and would offer. The secretary will report the amendment. <clears throat> Senator Frentz moves to amend Senate File 3692 as follows, page 22. This is Amendment A13. To the A13 Amendment, Senator Frentz. Thank you, Mr. President. I request a roll call vote. Roll call requested, roll call granted. Senator Frentz. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, what the A13 does is adjust the tax rates so that the benefit proposed in Senator Nelson's bill does not go to the top 1%. Those Minnesotans earning over $250,000. Those are hardworking Minnesotans. Those are family members. Those are friends and neighbors. But they are not who our tax policy should most benefit. It should benefit the working men and women. If you look at the 813 Amendment, what it does is just in fiscal 2022, it leaves about $130 million on the bottom line that we can put towards some of these very good ideas that my GOP friends admit these amendments relate to, and a much better use, I would say. So what would the people of Minnesota say about this proposal? Well, let me offer you this scenario. Say we lined up 100 Minnesotans representing top 1%, top 5%, top 50%, and then we put the tax benefits of this bill for 2022 in a wheelbarrow. I know it would be a big wheelbarrow. And we told them, hey, we got a surplus. We're going to give the money back as we wheel this wheelbarrow up the line, starting with the lowest income Minnesotans and going to the highest. We start pushing that wheelbarrow, and boy, those people on that 100 line are excited. Billions of dollars. We're going to get it back. Yay. 
first thing you need to know is the wheelbarrow goes right past the first 20. Zero. They're watching that wheelbarrow go by. Not a dime in this bill comes out of that wheelbarrow. They keep going and they start giving out some. As they get up towards the top, the wheelbarrow still got a lot in it. They get to the final person in line, the top 1%. Do you know how much money's still in that wheelbarrow? $130 million. And they take that $130 million and they dump it out in front of the top 1% and they say, here, this is your share of the tax bill that's gonna pass the Senate. Does that sound to you members like the kind of tax policy that is fair? Does that sound to you like what Minnesotans are telling us in these emails? Does that sound to you like what the janitor at South Central College in North Mankato or the single mother of two thinks we should be doing to be fair? I would suggest to you that it's not. Again, I appreciate those members of the majority party who acknowledged the great DFL amendments this morning and this week as we rolled out our omnibus bills. And I would just say to those members who were honest and said this is a good amendment, but we just can't do it. Mr. President, I'd say, yes, we can. We can pass this amendment, leave that money on the bottom line, and then go to work on some of the things in education, transportation, state government, all of it that Minnesotans really do want us to do. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, I encourage a green vote. Senator Nelson. Well, uh, th thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I would encourage a no vote uh, on this amendment. Uh, and again, I refer the members to the tax effectiveness of the amendment, uh, of the bill. This bill provides the greatest tax reduction percents to those who pay the least amount of taxes. And furthermore, um, we live in a highly progressive tax state. And so when you do provide tax relief, some of it does go to those who pay at, at higher rates. But as you will see, only 1%, 1% members of the tax relief in this bill goes to those um, higher level earner, earners that, uh, that um, the former uh, the, the senator is discussing in his, in his amendment. So again, uh, members, I encourage a no vote. Uh, the tax relief bill in front of you provides tax relief for every Minnesotan who pays income taxes with the highest percentage cut going to Minnesotans who pay the least amount of taxes. I encourage a no vote. Seeing no further discussion, the secretary will take the roll call on the A13 amendment. I call on Senator, uh, Senator Herr to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Herr. Uh, Mr. President, I'd like to 
Report aye for Senator Eaton. Eaton votes aye. Senator Herr. Aye for Senator Eaken. Eaken votes aye. Senator Herr. And aye for Senator Fateh. Fateh votes aye. I call on Senator Lang to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Lang. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Johnson votes no. Johnson votes no. Senator Lang. Senator Thomasoni votes no. Thomasoni votes no. Senator Lang. Senator Rosen votes no. Rosen votes no. Senator Lang. Senator Jasinski votes no. Jasinski votes no. <coughs> Senator Lang. Senator Goggin votes no. Goggin votes no. All members having voted with the desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 29 ayes and 37 nays, the motion does not prevail. The 813 amendment is not adopted. <laughs> Further discussion to the bill? Senator Senjum. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, uh, good discussion on a very, very important bill. Thinking about uh, Senator Kloss and his comment about those 15,000 individuals that are going to school, uh, leaving, leaving to go to colleges and universities across the country, uh, once they get that degree and start looking back to where they're going to have their career and look at tax rates, uh, they're going to look at uh, the tax rates in Minnesota. We know that. They do that. Uh, and then how many of us uh, know people that uh, are in Florida today? in South Dakota today and a whole bunch of other states today only because of tax rates in Minnesota. Uh, this is important. Uh, this is important. We have its opportunity to readjust these rates in Minnesota and, and make, them, uh, make them more palatable for a lot of people. And a lot of people that we all know we'd uh, much prefer uh, they would stay here and contribute to their communities as they uh, especially uh, graduate from college, and especially as they, frankly, go into retirement. Uh, why not stay and be with the kids, except for the tax rates that we have? Uh, with that, uh, Mr. President, I want to offer the A-12 Amendment. The Secretary will report the A-12 Amendment. Senator Senjum moves to amend. Senate File 3692 as follows. Page 25 after line 2, insert Section 7. This is Amendment A-12. To the A-12 Amendment, Senator Senjum. Thank you, Mr. President. And, and members, uh, I, I do this today because uh, I feel compelled to. Uh, it's an important part of our tax policy in Minnesota that is not in this bill. I do plan, frankly, to withdraw this amendment. But uh, I want to speak to it, and that is the historic tax credit. It's not in this bill. Happens to be in the bill in the other body. Happens to be, a, I think, a very important aspect of our tax policy in Minnesota. Uh, members, last year we extended this one year to now sunset on July 30th, 2022. Uh, I know from personal experience, uh, city of Casson, a high school that uh, is no longer in use. Uh, the school gave it to the city. Now the city's got this, uh, this school. It's been, they've had it for a number of years. They've had an opportunity to condoize it. The developer comes along and says, one year extension, I'm not, I'm not even gonna get involved in that. And that happens all over Minnesota. Uh, we've gotta put this historic tax rate, or tax, uh, uh, this tax credit, rather, uh, on a path. The path that does good things for Minnesota today, tomorrow, and going forward. And members, I just go back to, to data. And this is, this is, I think, the only tax credit that we have in our portfolio that annually is looked at by the University of Minnesota Extension Service. And they write pretty extensive reports about the, the tax credit on a year-to-year -year basis. And those reports, uh, frankly, bring forth some pretty interesting and, I think, outstanding results. If we just look from the 2011, when all this started, to 2021, uh, our state invested $124 million in this credit. It yielded $5 billion worth of economic activity. It, it yielded 28,000 jobs. It yielded, for, from the standpoint of the labor community, the trades and, and so on and so forth, uh, literally $1.9 billion worth of, of salaries from the standpoint of their work efforts. Now, that's important stuff. And you just look over, 
all, all in, in the grand totality of this, uh, we, we put a dollar into the historic tax credit and it yields about $11.50 back. That's a pretty good investment. It's a pretty good investment. I don't know of any other economic tool that we have in Minnesota that yields that kind of result. It's outstanding and we need to keep it going. So, uh, Mr. President, uh, as this bill goes forward, goes to the other chamber, comes back, uh, uh, I would only hope that we would take a long, long, hard look in the conference committee about putting this historic tax credit uh, uh, back on a path, uh, back on a path of consistency. The particular amendment I have today would take it to 2030. I think that's important. We need to have consistency in this program. It's proven itself. It needs to go forward. It's the kind of bill I think that uh, we all know does great things for economically, gives great things from the standpoint of job production, and frankly makes Main Street, think about this, Main Streets all across our cities that have these buildings which are way beyond the ability for any developer to come in and re-repair. This tax credit allows that to happen, and it's happened time after time after time. Makes our communities more viable, viable rather. It, it gives that flavor, that character. We, we tend just to tear these buildings down. Many of these buildings are going to go into tax forfeiture because they can't be fixed. This tax credit allows that to happen. So, members, as we, uh, again, as we reconsider this bill as it comes back, my dearest hope is that uh, it's got a historical tax credit in it and uh, we can move this program forward. Thank you, Mr. Uh, President, and I would withdraw the A-12 amendment. The A Senator Senjum withdraws the A-12 amendment. Seeing no further discussion, the Secretary will give the bill its third reading. House file number 3692, a bill for an act relating to taxation. Third reading. Further discussion. Senator Weger. Thank you, Mr. President, members. I believe the bill before us will cost about $3.3 billion when you go to reinsurance, unemployment insurance, uh, the tails for these investments, uh, there's not much left. And what greatly concerns me is what about public education? I call your attention to Article 13 Section 1 of the Minnesota Constitution. When we were sworn in, we rose our hand and we swore that we would uphold the Constitution. There's reference in there on a right to education, a duty by the legislature to provide it through taxation or otherwise with a thorough and efficient system of public schools. So here we are in the moment. What's going on in public schools? There's a mental health crisis in public schools, and this was pre-COVID. We have a teacher shortage, especially in special education. In fact, recruiting bus drivers is a challenge. The whole team is stressed. A record number of teachers, so sadly, are leaving the profession. We have a shortfall in special education funding. Special education should be fully funded for those students. Nearly 17% of Minnesota students are in special ed, a right that they got in Congress in 1975. But it is underfunded by over $800 million. In the budget target, there is zero, zero. And special ed students are underfunded in then what we call a cross-subsidy to make up for it of over 800 million. English language learners, the same, about 125 million underfunded. What about new immigrants that may be coming over in quest for freedom, maybe from Ukraine, which we say we all support? What about funding? fully funding English language learners. The formula, what all school districts depend on, 60% of the funding, 
The budget target, zero. Special education, as I mentioned, zero, E-L-L, -L, zero. But the Constitution, through taxation or otherwise, asks us to address this responsibility. And yes, it's a mandate. We are expected to do this. So when you look at what the Republican majority is proposing with the tax bill and the other provisions in their budget, public schools are being thrown under the bus. It's shamefully inadequate. It's defunding public education. On that point, many school districts right now, notwithstanding the increase that we had last year, school districts are telling us, you have not kept pace with inflation. And this is from organizations representing the school districts, the business officials, and they go back to 2003. Public education is being underfunded, and there's consequences. Who's going to speak up for the special education students, for the English language learners, for the teachers that are leaving, that are stressed, for the students that need mental health services, more counselors, chemical dependency counselors, nurses, psychologists, the whole staff team. We had a long meeting last night, and yes, there is 30 million in literacy, thank you, 0.3% of the budget. This is totally, shamefully inadequate. And I ask us that to all go back during the break, reach out to your school districts. Well, I know Senator Putnam will, you're married to the superintendent, but talk to teachers, talk to students, talk to parents. What's happening? And look at the budget in Rochester. They're getting pink slips ready. There will be $23 million they're looking at cuts. And I can take you to Bemidji and Brainerd and several others, and we could walk through what it costs on the special ed subsidy for the cross subsidy or for ELL. It's all here. Find out. Talk to them about it. And let's see if we can substantially improve as we hopefully get a resolution to a responsible budget that is fair and balanced for all Minnesotans. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Isaacson. Thank you, Mr. President. Last night, um, we had a hearing on E12 in which a budget proposal that is 0.3% so one-third of one percent of the total surplus was offered uh, for uh, solving a problem around literacy, which I think is a commendable issue to be working on. Sadly, that bill was like getting one yard on 4th and 45. It did not do anything to get us where we need to go to help with education. On top of that, I inquired as to what the budget was for higher education, and that is point 1%, so 1%, 0.1% of 1%, right? Uh, it was a, a very small amount. Again, woefully inadequate to meet the needs of our students and our systems. Yet, we have a tax bill here in front of us today that just for the top 2% spends 5% of the surplus. Not 0.5, but 5% of the surplus on the top 2% of income earners. Folks, I teach a couple of courses. You might have heard of them. I teach uh, intercultural and interpersonal communication. And one of the things we talk about when we talk about who we are and becoming aware is we talk about how do we measure what we do. Mr. Chair, Mr. President. 
Uh, Senators, if you could please keep your conversations low. Um, Thank you. We'd appreciate the speaker would appreciate it. Thank you. So we talk about in the lecture, how do we know who we are? What's our concept of self? And you know what the biggest indicator of that is? You are what you consistently do, folks. You are what you consistently do. Your values are stated by your behavior, not your rhetoric. Your values right now across the aisle by a number of like 50 to 1 is the top 2% over our kids and our schools. It's that simple. You can try to move the numbers around all you want, but the fact of the matter is 5% of the surplus is going to tax cuts to the richest 2% in the state, yet we can only afford collectively 0.4%, not 4%, 0.4% for education. That is the values. That is the message, the takeaway for what we see in this tax bill, period. And that's just an education. And let's, let's just dive into that for a second. You know, over the past few years, I've had many good conversations with my friends across the aisle who've earnestly told me, you know what, if we just had money, I'd love to do something. We just, our hands are tied. We don't have any money. We can't do anything. Our hands are tied. And so last night was quite the experience when that excuse is no longer available with the $9 billion surplus. That excuse doesn't exist anymore, folks. So instead, the chair just chose to stop answering my questions because there wasn't a good answer over and over again. Right? And so that, that to me, is concerning. While I do agree with the chair of E12's assessment about literacy, and I am pleased that 30 million is going into that. I think that's really important. That's just such a small piece of the overall puzzle. An important piece, but it's not even the biggest. What are we not doing in education when we have a bill like this in contrast to other bills? What are we not doing? Well, we're not doing the cross-subsidy, which we've heard we talked about. We're not doing programming for special needs kids in our schools. We're not doing mental health Supports, we're not bringing counselors into the schools, we're not providing uh, for more nurses. Our nurse to student ratio right now should be criminal, in my opinion. It's ridiculous. We certainly still haven't, even though I've heard everybody in this room at least one time talk about how important current technical education is, yet we still can't crack that nut, it seems like, except for the schools that have the biggest tax bases that can do it on their own, which then further exasperates some of the achievement gap. And <clears throat> frankly, we haven't supported our paraprofessionals. You know, I watched my kids in, in elementary and kindergarten talk about what their school experience was. And I can tell you there's no question in my mind that our schools would have failed had we not had the dedicated professionals supporting our teachers. And yet we fund our schools so little they can't even be full-time employees with benefits. Think about that. Think about that. Any parent out there listening right now, those paraprofessionals, which are the backbone of helping keep our schools together and giving the teachers the opportunity to do their jobs, aren't even valued enough to be full-time people making a living wage and with benefits. But we do have enough money in our surplus to give a huge tax cut to the top 2%. I'm just one guy talking over here, right? And I get that there's many messages going on, and I'm sure uh, we'll hear all kinds of excuses and reasons why things are happening the way they are in the tax bill, or there's a future bill coming. Let me dangle that in front of you. Hopefully it goes well. I'd love to see a future bill. I hope you're right about that. That'd be awesome. But the reality is, is this bill is a value statement for the Senate GOP. And your value is this. You value the top 2% more than you value our students, more than you value our teachers, more than you value our schools. And, it, and, and, I, and I'm not just saying that like I'm trying to impugn motives, I'm just looking at the data, the numbers, the numbers of what you did, just making a comparison for you. And it's, it's super disappointing. You know, every year that I've been, every session I've been in office, I've offered a middle class tax cut. Much time, sometimes to the chagrin of my own party, I've offered a tax cut that cuts the taxes on the first and second tiers and blinks off. Because if there's anybody that needs more money, it's the people that don't have them, that are living paycheck to paycheck. I can't get traction on that ever, despite 
hearing my friends across the aisle talk about tax cuts, I offer them a bipartisan solution that will guarantee tax cuts to those that need it most, yet that falls on deaf ears. But here we are, 5% of the surplus, going to the richest 2%. I, I just, I, I find it difficult. You know, I want to be mad, <laughs> but like my dad would say, but I'm just disappointed. I'm just disappointed. I, I hope we can do more than that. I hope that this is the beginning point, that this is actually just posturing, that we know we're going to be in a negotiation with the governor and the House, and I hope we come back and we do better for our people, for our kids. That's my biggest concern. My biggest concern is I want to make sure we make these schools whole. We're $1.4 billion behind due to inflation. And yes, Senator Nelson, I'd love to have the discussion to explain how that works, because I know you have a differing opinion, and I'd be happy to show you how this works. But the reality is, is we have a huge, huge shortfall. And we have an unbelievable opportunity to make that difference right now for so many kids across our state. Yet, we seem to be unwilling to do that. But we do have a tax bill that gives a huge surplus tax cut to the richest 2%. So I hope that we think about that. I'd love us to move forward and have an opportunity to maybe make some better choices about our tax dollars and support those that desperately need it. Uh, I am a no on this, vote, on this bill. Thank you. Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, I'm going to urge you all to support this great tax bill that we have before us. The premise is very simple. This giant surplus that Minnesota is sitting on, largest I've ever seen, it's not our money. It's the people's money. It's the taxpayers' money. We're one of the highest tax states in the nation, and somehow we still ended up overtaxing Minnesotans by more than $9 billion. The, one of the biggest things I hear in my district as I go out amongst my constituents is, you've overtaxed us. That's our money. Give our money back. And we're doing that here in two key ways. We're fully eliminating Social Security, which is long overdue, should have done this years ago, and this will help a lot of seniors around my district. I have a pretty significant older population in my district, and I hear about this issue regularly because for many of them, their Social Security income is all that they have as they're moving into the latter stages of their life. This will be a huge benefit to many people like that in my district and around the state of Minnesota. And then we're cutting in half the lowest tax bracket in the state of Minnesota to provide tax relief to all Minnesotans, but especially our low and middle income Minnesotans. Long overdue, we don't need to be one of the highest tax rate states in the country. This is a good provision to push that number back down. Members, this is not our money. This is the people's money, and we need to give it back. And I urge members to support this. Senator Coleman. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise in support of this tax bill. You know, I heard a couple of times members talk about what growing families in Minnesota want, and I thought maybe one of the members walking in those shoes should stand up and, and offer another perspective. I think I speak for many of my colleagues in our caucus who are raising an infant or two right now, who are buying diapers and formula in today's economy when I say that times for growing families in Minnesota, they're tough right now. I talk to mothers, I talk to fathers in my district and around the state every single day, and I hear the same thing from families who are just getting started. They need relief, they want relief, and we have the opportunity today to give them relief immediately. They aren't asking for a government spending spree. They aren't asking for a one-time check. They are asking for permanent tax relief so that they can catch their breaths. Government bank accounts are seeing record surpluses, but
but my constituents are paying for it, and their bank accounts are being squeezed. We have the opportunity today to help every single Minnesotan out with this tax bill, and I urge a green vote. Thank you. Senator Johnson Stewart. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I moved here in 1986 from Wisconsin, and I remember thinking what a great state Minnesota was. I came from a family of teachers, and I was amazed and thrilled at the value that Minnesotans seem to put on public education. Uh, it made me proud, and I wanted to stay here, and I have seen in the last uh, 27 years, us constantly going the wrong direction around funding public education and making sure that we maintain those values. Um, we've seen what's happened in Wisconsin. Uh, my mom and dad were proud teachers in Wisconsin, and when my daughter went to River Falls to be a teacher, my mom said, well, you can go to school in Wisconsin, but don't you dare come back here and teach, because we don't value our teachers in Wisconsin. And I thought, yeah, but we do in Minnesota. So I'd love it if we could get back to that point where I could stand up and proudly say we're, we're supporting public education. But we've heard a lot about that already. And what I want to talk about is infrastructure. So no surprise. Uh, but this is an area where I feel like I need to sound the alarm. Uh, when I first heard that we had a seven and then a nine billion dollar uh, surplus, I was so elated, especially as it was coincidental with our Federal Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. The feds are wanting to send us billions in dollars in infrastructure funding. Much of that money will require a match on our part. And over the last several months, I have seen in my committees the money that we have as um, surplus get allocated for this and that and this and that. And as my colleague Senator Murphy said, we have already spent over half of it seemingly. I'm very nervous because at a time when the American Society of Civil Engineers recently came out with its revised report card saying that we have billions of dollars in infrastructure money that we need to spend just to keep even in Minnesota we're ignoring our responsibility around that and not taking this great opportunity to fund so much of that backlog. Now, granted, we don't have our bonding bills yet, uh, but I've been told not to expect much more than what the governor has requested at $2.7 billion. We could spend, we could spend all $9 billion in surplus on infrastructure right now. Not that I'd advocate that, but that's how many needs we have. Now, if your house was falling apart, if you had uh, broken toilets, if you had sewage coming up in the basement, if you had a hole in your roof, if you had broken windows, if you had drinkable or water that was not drinkable, and let's say you got a couple thousand dollars from your uh, great aunt who passed away, I think we would all agree that it might be irresponsible to spend that money on anything other than getting your house in order. Our house in Minnesota is equally out of order. We have many residents who do not have clean water to drink. We have many residents whose sewage, flank, frankly, goes right into the creek behind their house. And if you don't believe me, come see me. I'll tell you where to go look. I went on every bonding trip with my colleagues, and I saw my colleagues from the same party that's promoting this tax cut, I saw them proudly standing with the mayors. Let's see, we went to Tyler, where the mayor got up and talked about sewage in her basement. That's in Senator Weber's district. I saw Senator Kiffmeyer at the St. Michael 
sewage treatment plant, talked proudly about how we were going to come, and as a state, we were going to do something to make sure that their sewage was treated uh, properly. I saw Senator Johnson up in Red Lake Falls tell the people that we hear you, you're paying way too much for water that frankly is not even drinkable. We have a huge problem. And uh, I support all of those colleagues. I too want their infrastructure in their small communities to be repaired. Uh, I'm just saying right now, we gotta put the brakes on this. I don't see enough money being held back for matching funds um, up in, Senate, in uh, Duluth, we have a bridge that's going to need rebuilding. The Blatnick Bridge could cost up to $2 billion. A 20% match on that, pretty easy math, is $400 million. My friends at the DOT say, well, we can't build that bridge. We don't have $400 million. And so I just want to call out that we have a surplus now. We may not have a surplus to last us the five years that the federal infrastructure and jobs money is going to last us. And if we don't be thoughtful about that, we will not be benefiting from significant improvements in our infrastructure. So I urge a no vote on this. Thank you. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I'm pleased to vote for this tax bill. Minnesotans know where this, tax sur where this surplus came from. Minnesota families and small businesses know it came from them. They've been overtaxed for way too long. Residents in Scott County have said, we want you to prioritize our budgets that are being hurt by inflation. We want to end double taxation on Social Security benefits. We shouldn't have to drive our seniors out of the state so they can afford to live. Shortly after we put the fourth tier of income tax in, we lost $3 billion in taxable assets. They left the state. That's not good for the Minnesota economy. That's not good for the state. Colleagues have mentioned that we spent money on paying off the unemployment insurance debt, and replenishing the fund. Governor Walls asked Minnesota businesses to shut down and force them to lay off their employees. We promised to hold them harmless for that. And because the House DFL has failed to pass the unemployment replenishment bill, an effective tax increase on anyone who employs Minnesotans, the very Minnesotans we're talking about, the very Minnesotans we want to give a tax break to, we are making it more expensive to employ them and hire them, and we are artificially keeping their real wages down because it costs more to employ them. And we promised Minnesota workers that we would make sure the unemployment trust fund was stable and reliable in case they needed it again. So members, when you hear we spent this money on the unemployment trust fund, remember we're keeping a promise for something that state government did to these people that caused record unemployment claims. What Governor Walls said was one of the greatest poverty avoidance programs that we've had in place in a long, long time. I don't know about you, but what I hear from my residents, my district, they don't want a one-time handout. They want ongoing tax relief every year. But you know what they say to me? Senator Pratt, please consider our family budgets too. Thank you, Mr. President. Next up is Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Mr. President and members. I rise in support of this tax bill. Without question, when folks are asked around the state, do you want a one-time check or do you want ongoing sustained reduction of your tax payments? And overwhelmingly, the result is, hey, yeah, every year I benefit from this tax cut. I'll take that any day over a one-time check. 
The other thing is in regards to some of these uh, infrastructure needs, let me tell you, since my uh, district uh, city was named in regards to bonding tour, MPCA said, hey, we got this great plant out there. You put it in your wastewater pond, it'll absorb water and all these wonderful things about it. Yeah, what happens? Ten years later, they call it a noxious weed and shut it down putting my district in the position that we have to spend more money again and again because pollution control didn't even check out this plant. I mean, do you think maybe you might like to as the MPCA? Do you think you might want to check that out a little bit better before you tell cities to spend millions and millions of dollars to do something? You would think they would know that. And this many years later, they say, no, now it's a noxious weed, shut it down, you got to replace it with something else. It is the government that caused that problem and put that tax burden on my city. And I don't appreciate that whatsoever. But one thing I know will really help these taxpayers is a tax cut every single year going forward. That's what will help them to buy school books, replace the refrigerator, take care of their lawnmower, take care of fixing up a car. You know, folks, it's just possible that our taxpayers who get to keep more money in their pocket, they have needs for that money. They know what to do with their own money. They're the ones that are re uh, caused the surplus. They're the ones that overpaid. Well, then I think it's only fair to give back to those who have overpaid. Let them take money out of their checkbook, not the government. Let them take the money out of their checkbook and use it for the needs of their families, their children, their workers. And not only that, there are many small businesses who file their taxes as a sole proprietorship. And so their issues here, they may show a large amount of revenue because it's small business income. That doesn't mean that's personal income to them. It's a small business income. When we leave money in their checkbook, they're able to hire more employees, buy new equipment for their business. These things stimulate the economy and actually, in the future, generate additional revenue. So contrary to what we think, it's a stimulus for economic that it ends up also helping to generate more tax revenue, but it comes out of the powerful effect of money left in the private economy for so many reasons. This is a fantastic tax bill that is good for Minnesotans, good for families, good for businesses, all the way through. Thank you, members. Vote yes for Senate File 3692, the greatest, largest tax cut in Minnesota history. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Murphy. Thank you, Mr. President. Senate File 3692, the tax bill before us is flawed for certain. It is reckless from a budgetary perspective, obviously, and it is predictable in that it favors the wealthy few. And as we prepare uh, to head into the recess where we will join our families and celebrate as we do, I am remind, reminded of the calling from my faith tradition to look out for the least among us. And this proposal doesn't achieve that goal. I listened to the tax hearing uh, yesterday uh, where this bill was uh, debated. And the author of the bill talked about how it excludes a number of Minnesotans, uh, approximately 542 1,881 Minnesotans who will see no benefit from this proposal. They pay taxes, they work, many of them, they pay taxes, but they don't earn enough to pay an income tax, and therefore they will see no benefit from this proposal. That is 18% of our population, nearly a fifth of Minnesotans. Um, that's a significant number of people uh, that are being left out in the cold from the benefit uh, of this proposal that spends well more than the structural surplus that we have available to us. This proposal does favor the wealthy. 
We've heard our colleagues talk about it today. It tips toward them in, in the income tax and in the Social Security proposal. It favors the wealthy before our schools. It favors the wealthy before a safe place to live. It favors the wealthy before our lowest earners. It favors the wealthy before frontline workers, the people who clean our buildings, who have cut our meat, who care for seniors, for people with disabilities, for our children, the people who teach our students. And it is their labor that has created so much of this surplus, and this bill leaves them out in the cold. As we go into the recess to celebrate with our families, I will be thinking about my obligation to the least among us. This proposal does not reflect my values or Minnesotans' values. It is a statement of priorities, not mine, but those of the majority. It does undercut our future. And if we're not elected for anything but preparing for our future, I don't know what it is. This bill falls short on all of those measures, and I ask you to vote no. Senator Swadzinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I really wasn't going to say anything, and a little while ago, one of my colleagues suggested that we all visit a, a school next week over break and talk to the teachers and talk to the students and just see what they're thinking. And I've been sitting here now for half an hour reflecting on that because that's something I've already done. The CDC um, just released a, a report that said 50% of our students feel persistently sad and persistently hopeless. One of the things I got out of college, one of the few things I got out of college was learning about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And I really truly believe one of our goals here is to try to get all of our youth, all our entire population to that goal of self-actualization that Maslow pre preached. And I worry that we're not getting our kids through that, those lower phases of physical safety and self-esteem. And these kids are our future. When, they're, when they're, they, they're needing us at the most right now, they're screaming at us, we seem to be looking away. I asked the social workers at one of my three high schools a couple weeks ago, are suicidal ideations up? I was just curious. And his response to me, they're, they're through the roof. And he said, at one previous to COVID, I have three or four students a year thinking thoughts like that. And now he says, I see one to two a week. And I have to tell them there's a three to four month waiting period in order to see a therapist. If this tax cut passes, and I'm sure it will, I hope that in the coming days, all of us find, find some sense of relief by going to your local schools and just talking to the kids. Find out where their heads are at. So what money may be left in the budget after this tax cut, maybe we decide to spend it on our schools. I, I met with a kid, a student, a senior, in a class just last week, and she came up after class and she was in tears. And she said to me, my lifetime dream was to go to a school, an art school in Texas. And she said to me, I can't go to a state where everybody hates me. And I don't know what your views are on that story, but nonetheless, that's one kid. She feels like an entire state in our country hates her. There's so much we need to be thinking about and helping our kids, everybody. Like I said, they're our future. They're looking to this body and going, we need you. We need your support. We need your love. We need your help. And I just feel like we're looking away. And um, so I hope next week you, you have the opportunity to maybe visit one of the schools in your district, seize that opportunity, take on that opportunity, seize that responsibility so that when we do come back and we look at what's left in the budget, that maybe we'll find a little bit of money in, um, for, for, for our kids. Thank you, Mr. President. Further comments before we begin closing comments on the bill? 
Seeing none, Senator Dietzik. Thank you, Mr. President. This might, not be the, this might not be the last tax bill, but I still want to thank staff because they keep the process moving and they help all of us look good. They put a lot of time into this bill. I want to thank the committee staff, Madeline Hoy and Brian Snyhoff. I want to thank the DFL Republican and Senate researchers, Krista Broughton and Daniel Mickelberg. I want to thank our nonpartisan staff, council, research, legislative and fiscal staff, Nora Pollock, Eric Sylvia, Jay Wilms, and Bjorn Arneson. They do a great job. As Senator Nelson in committee said yesterday, they are available to help us all the time. They, they don't judge us with their questions, they just help us figure it out. So we are so appreciative of them. I also want to thank my LA, Tatiana Reed, and my interns this session, Susan Herter and Zoe Zander. We couldn't do this job with the help of our LAs and our interns. It takes teamwork. Many people might not think taxes are fun, but in committee we have fun. We have good, thoughtful, civil discussions. So we've been told this is not the final tax bill. It's the first tax bill. And usually when you think of the first, that's your priority. So this bill, discusses priorities. But how can we have that full discussion when we don't know what the full Senate financial fiscal priorities are? We and the public haven't seen a targeted list that shows what each committee is getting. We've heard snippets from people that have talked about the committees they're on, but we don't know a broad overview. What are those targets? The Senate isn't required to release targets in even years, but it helps us shape an overall perspective. We can't do this in a vacuum. This tax bill should be part of a global, forward-looking agreement that lays out a strategic plan to address the challenges facing Minnesotans. This tax bill, we've heard, spends $3 billion in the current biennium and $5 billion in, at least $5 billion in 24 and 25. That's over $8 billion and it doesn't help every Minnesotan. We heard testimony in committee, and we heard Senator Klein mention earlier that this bill provides tax cuts for the wealthy. Over one billion goes to the top 20%. There's over 500,000 Minnesotans. This does not help. It doesn't help those people living paycheck to paycheck. The average Minnesotan making around $50,000, according to Senate research, nonpartisan research data, will get an average tax cut of $372. $372 is about $7 a week. $7. $7 can buy you a single shot large almond milk latte, but it won't pay for formula and diapers. $7 does not cover childcare costs, and it doesn't help families find childcare options. In committee, we heard about a family in Mankato wanting to help their fifth grader, especially after the last few years of the pandemic. They were falling behind in math. The family wanted to get a tutor to help that child keep up. They wanted to use the K-12 tax credit. They were all excited that maybe that would help them pay for the tutor. They made $40,000 a year. They did not qualify. This bill doesn't address the K-12 tax credits. $7 a week doesn't cover their tutoring costs. We heard from Senator Weger about the school district struggling. Many are facing deficits. I know I've heard from my school district and I've heard from several school districts across the state. A lot of these are caused by unfunded special education mandates. I've heard from parents, school board members, and school districts across the state from Northfield to Rochester to Robbinsdale. They have all said if they don't get some assistance, they're probably going to have to lay off staff or they're going to have to cut class sizes or increase class sizes. We heard testimony in committee from a White Bear Lake teacher. White Bear Lake, she said, is facing a $3.8 million deficit. Any tax cuts that we are giving here that's not helping those schools, that's not helping White Bear Lake, is going to further hurt those people impacted by the pandemic. 
it's going to further hurt our students. There is nothing in those, this bill to help those schools. $7 a week does not help those schools and those parents keep class sizes low. It does not help kids' mental health. It does not buy down special education cross subsidy. It does not reduce our education disparity gap. And it does not increase graduation rates. The bill says helping working families pay for childcare or dependent care is not a priority. Improving education for our kids is not a priority in this bill. We heard Senator Claussen talking about the crushing, crushing student debt. $7 does not pay for that debt. It does not help our Minnesota workers. It doesn't help our young Minnesota workers. In the Housing Committee, we talk about and we hear about from everybody across the state the lack of housing and the rising cost of housing. News stories have talked about rent increases of over $200 a month. $7 a week, $28 a month, doesn't cover those rent increases. The average price of a new home is about $300,000, might even be $350,000 now. $7 a week doesn't help that first time home buyer buy that home. This bill does not help reduce our housing homeownership disparity gap. Local governments from small towns to cities to counties, they're all facing inflation as well. They're having a hard time recruiting and retaining employees. This bill does nothing for them. It doesn't prioritize local government aid. It doesn't help them recruit and retain staff, including police officers. News stories have also talked about rising property taxes. I think in my city it's about 10%. That is caused by rising property values and by the increased cost of those local government services. There's nothing in this bill that helps reduce property taxes. 30% of our seniors use the renter's credit. This bill doesn't help seniors on a fixed income stay in their home. It doesn't increase the renter's credit, and it doesn't reduce property taxes to keep grandma in her home. This bill says working Minnesotans and helping working Minnesotans afford their home is not a priority. The bill also doesn't help with health care. $7 doesn't pay for increasing drug costs. It doesn't help our seniors pay for those increasing drug prices. I've heard people say this isn't a budget year, and we'll address some of those issues next year in a budget year. But the, this bill is spending. This bill is a budget. It spends over 80% of the state's anticipated structural surplus. When you add in inflation, it puts us in a functional deficit. We should be helping our most vulnerable. As Senator Murphy said, we should be helping those the least among us. We should be helping those still recovering from the pandemic in this K-shaped economic recovery. We should be fulfilling our promise to our essential workers. $7 does not fulfill the promise to the child care worker to our nursing home assistants, to the janitors, and to the grocery store staff. $7 can get them a latte, but it doesn't pay for childcare, their tutoring, or their rent increases. We need to pass frontline worker hero pay. We worked together to get things done. We felt an urgency lately, and we got things done. We passed the bill requiring any divestment in Russia to help Ukraine. We passed the bill to fund ALS research. So we can work together and get things done when we want to. We have an opportunity right now to work together to create a budget that provides tax relief for all Minnesotans, not just tax cuts for the wealthy. We have an opportunity to work together to help all those Minnesotans, no matter their race, their religion, their age, or their zip code. We have an opportunity and we have a duty to work together and we can do it 
to find balance and create a strategic economic plan for Minnesota that includes a tax bill and the finance bills that builds successful, thriving communities. Communities with strong schools, a good housing stock, and good jobs from Ada to Zambroda. We can do it, but this tax bill doesn't. I urge a no vote. To the author of the bill, Senator Nelson. Well, thank you, Mr. President and members. Senate File 3692 does provide tax relief, $8.4 billion of tax relief going directly to Minnesotans who overpaid their taxes, who paid more than what our state budget needs. Now, our state budget has increased dramatically over the years. We can, you can all see that graph where our budget has increased dramatically. Spending has gone up. But it's amazing, members, that our tax revenues have even surpassed the increases in spending in our state budget. So much so that here we are in a non-budget year. Just to remind members, we have a two-year biennial budget. We're in the middle of that budget year. And yet, yet, we have collected $9.25 billion more than our ever-increasing state budget required. And then, just so we know, let, let, facts are our friends. Facts are our friends. The majority, the majority, the biggest tax relief, the most tax cuts go to Minnesotans are at our lowest uh, income levels. They receive the greatest amount of tax cuts. You need to look at your tax incident study, and if you want to see what percent cut income tax Minnesotans receive, take it out and take a look. Starting at $30,000, they're receiving 100% tax cut on their income taxes. Now, if you can go up decile by decile, and you get to that top decile, those making 500000 or more, members, they're seeing a 1% reduction in their income tax. So the income tax reductions are focused and running through our first tier. We are cutting it nearly in half. And the average tax relief for 2.4 million tax filers is $759 a year, every year, year after year, not just a one-time check coming in the mail. And members, we're losing ground to our neighboring states. In our state, our lowest rate right now, the lowest rate that we tax Minnesotans in our most modest incomes is actually higher than the highest rate in 24 states. We continue to tax our citizens at excessive rates. And let's think about those states around us. A number of you live in uh, border communities, and you're suffering as well. For example, in Iowa, just to the south, they not only just passed legislation to cut their income taxes to a flat rate of 3.9% for everyone, but they also are removing all, all taxation on all retirement income. That's more than Social Security income, which they have already exempted from taxation. That includes your IRA distributions, taxable pensions, and annuities for those over 55. Members, we, need, we are standing in quicksand here, and the world is moving around us, and the money is moving with it. People are leaving our state because they cannot afford to retire here. And their CPAs will tell them, you certainly can't afford to die in Minnesota. This tax relief proposal provides needed tax relief. And our budget, this is not a budget year. We've had a lot of talks about budgetary items. We will address those in our next budget. 
But members, we are addressing the $9.25 billion over our mandatory reserves, our cash flow, over our, our expenses. It needs to go back, members. It needs to go back to Minnesotans. And now, there's a very fundamental difference here as well. We are focused on providing tax relief to Minnesotans, starting through the first tier income tax. And the question to be asked is, who knows best? Who knows best how to survive 7.9% inflation? Who knows best what the needs are when it comes to buying those diapers or formula or putting gas in the car or paying to heat your apartment or your home with 30% energy costs rising? Who knows best? Well, I put my trust in Minnesotans. I believe Minnesotans know best how to spend the excess revenues that have been sent to our state. So number one, let us trust Minnesotans. And then let's help our state get out of being an island of high taxation. Yes, we want people to stay in Minnesota. Yes, we want our college graduates to choose to live in Minnesota. Yes, we want new businesses to start in Minnesota and to expand in Minnesota. But members, our tax climate now, our tax climate now is encouraging people to flee our state, is not encouraging to empowering Minnesotans. We need to do better, and this, this massive budget surplus gives us an opportunity to do so. I include a yes, I encourage a yes vote. It is high time that we quit double taxing those Social Security benefits that Minnesota seniors purchased when their paychecks were taxed year after year, decade after decade. And then they come and it's okay, I can get my Social Security. And oh no, we're gonna tax you again, uh, Minnesotans. We have got to stop this and it's time that we right size our tax code to fit our needs and to empower Minnesota businesses. I encourage a yes vote. Senator Lopez Francis. Thank you, Mr. President and members. Today we're making clear to Minnesotans all over what we value and we're also laying clear our vision and our future for this state. We make clear who we prioritize and who we leave behind. We all know that taxes and budget bills are not just spreadsheets on a paper. They represent our values, they represent our priorities and our hopes for the future of the state. They're also a legacy to the next generation of Minnesotans. Minnesota has always been a great place to live and work. I came here because of the great value of education and higher ed. That is exactly what brought me to the state and what has kept me here. And we have been lucky to have this environment because both sides of the aisle has, have invested in this legacy and in this vision of Minnesota. They made sure that we had quality schools, quality infrastructure, clean air, water, and we invested in things that aimed at making families and businesses and communities thrive. Today we have a chance to continue on that legacy if we so choose. But unfortunately, this bill that we have in front of us members is an irresponsible and costly bill brought to you by the majority that does not meet the moment. It imperils our state's future budget stability and it leaves out hundreds of thousands of Minnesotans. Yes, we have an unprecedented surplus members which gives us the opportunity to make a difference for every Minnesotan. It's a failure of leadership to pass this bill today because it fails our schools, it fails our working families, and it fails all of our communities. And above all, it's not what the Republican majority says it is because it does not help everyone. 
Let's look at who gets the guarantees in this bill and who gets the promises. In the Republican majority's bill that we have today, the wealthiest Minnesotans get the guarantees. Under this bill, more than $240 million in tax breaks go to those earning more than $250,000 a year. And those tax breaks will flow to them each and every year permanently. In other words, the people at the top of the income scale, many who have thrived during this pandemic, get a guarantee of the largest tax breaks. And then they get them every year into the future. Those are the guarantees in this bill. Now let's look at the promises. Who gets the promises? More than half a million Minnesotans, over 540,000 struggling taxpayers across the state will get no benefit, no benefit at all from this costly bill. Let me repeat that. 540,000 taxpayers at the lower end of the income scale get no benefit at all. That's a lot of taxpayers getting nothing but broken promises. And since tomorrow we start the baseball season, weather permitting, I will illustrate it in this way. The number of people left out of this bill would fill, fill Target Field where the Twins play more than 13 times. It represents the entire populations of Rochester, St. Cloud, Mankato, Moorhead, Prior Lake, Winona, Chaska, White Bear Lake, Maple Grove, Wilmer, Stillwater, Brainerd, Worthington, and Bemidji combined. That's a lot of broken promises. That's a lot of Minnesotans who won't benefit from the Republican majority's central budget priority with a fancy tagline. To make matters worse, for the hundreds of thousands of Minnesotans left out, this bill actually cuts taxes for more than a quarter of a million non-Minnesotans. I repeat, it helps 265,000 people who are not from Minnesota. It begs the question who we are fighting for. There are a lot of broken promises in this bill, members, but those broken promises are not just confined to this legislation. They will ripple throughout everything we try to do this year and as we move into an uncertain future with the potential recession that we're starting into, with more COVID uncertainty, and for more international instability. To be clear, the $240 million in yearly tax breaks for the wealthiest Minnesotans in this bill is eight times more than what Republican-led Education Committee approved for our schools last night. I believe it was $30 million. $30 million for education. I repeat, under the Republican tax bill, we're spending 800% more to give the wealthiest Minnesotans a tax break than we are on our schools. Think about that. I'm embarrassed. Today I have the open house for my kindergartner. I'm going to go to my district and they're going to ask me, how's it going? And I'm going to say, I'm sorry, the $6 million you're asking for, for this district, for Edina, it's, that's in the House bill. The Senate has nothing. Senator Nelson, Rochester's asking for $13 million. That's in the House bill. It's not in the Senate. Because of the size of these tax breaks, we are breaking our promises to our schools, to our teachers, to our students, and to our parents, and to our future. Our schools are being swamped by special education costs. They are crying out for help with mental health services and counselors that the pandemic has made clear we desperately needed. Thousands of our teachers are beleaguered by crowded classrooms and the pandemic. They are thinking of leaving the profession because they don't feel supported, just that, like that girl that Senator Swasinski mentioned. Yet this bill is stopping us from providing any resources to deal with those very real problems. You cannot just ignore them and walk away from them. They are there. Listen, go to visit a school during your spring break. You will hear from them. This bill also breaks the long-held promise to our 
our GOP colleagues made to our frontline workers, who sacrificed so much for the past years, who they are also ignoring. It precludes us from giving them the hero bonuses that we have prioritized as a caucus and that we should pr prioritize as a legislature. We have tried to, twice on this floor to help frontline workers, but they were blocked both times by this Republican majority. DFLers today offered tax cuts proposals that would more quickly give significant benefits to working Minnesota families to help them deal with the rising cost. Those proposals would put much money in the pockets of families this year, now, to help them putting gas in the car, paying for rent and childcare. Importantly, unlike the Republican tax break, our DFL proposals that we laid out today are responsible and would not imperil future budget or force future cuts to our schools, our health care system, or to any other Minnesotan priorities. But in the end, they were all rejected by the Republican majority. So to the Minnesotans that are being left out today by this bill, we hear you and we will continue to fight for you for tax cuts that benefit you. To our schools and frontline workers, who hear, we hear you and we will keep fighting for you because you are worth the effort. And to every Minnesotan who values clean air, water, safe communities, and affordable health care, we will keep fighting for you. Our vision for the future of this state is vastly different from what the Republicans are offering today. And we will keep reminding Minnesotans of that, not only today, but this summer, this fall, and into the future. I urge a no vote on this costly, fiscally irresponsible bill. Taglines don't solve problems. Let's come to the table with real solution and not fake fixes. Thank you. Senator Miller. Thank you, Mr. President and members. Uh, before I share a few thoughts about this awesome tax bill, uh, I want to put some of the numbers into perspective. So last year, in 2021, the legislature passed a bipartisan $51 billion two-year budget. $51 billion two-year budget. Less than a year later, the state of Minnesota has a budget surplus of over $9 billion, a budget surplus of over $9 billion in a non-budget year. And when you have a surplus, when the state has a surplus that large, it means one thing. The state of Minnesota is over-collecting from the taxpayers. The state is collecting too much money from the people of Minnesota. And we have heard from the people of Minnesota loud and clear. Give in the pockets of Minnesotans is through permanent, ongoing tax relief so people have more money in their pockets every single paycheck, week after week, month after month, year after year. Permanent ongoing tax relief. Members, this tax bill has two major priorities. Number one, stop taxing Social Security income. The state of Minnesota is one of only 12 states, one of only 12 states that still taxes Social Security income. Under this proposal, Minnesotans who receive Social Security benefits will no longer be taxed on those benefits. Members, it is time to eliminate this burdensome tax on our seniors. Next, this bill cuts the first income tax bracket, the rate on the first income tax bracket. The first, not the fourth tier, members, not the fourth tier, the first tier. And what does that mean? What does that mean? That means that every Minnesotan, every single Minnesotan who pays income taxes will have more money in their pockets as a result of this bill. 
And there's been a lot of discussion about who gets that money. Well, if you look at how that income tax relief is distributed, members, the vast majority of that goes to middle class Minnesotans. The vast majority of the income tax relief goes to middle class Minnesotans. The state is overtaxing the people of Minnesota. It is time to give the money back to the people with permanent ongoing tax relief so senior citizens have more money in their pockets and working Minnesotans have more money in their pockets every single paycheck, week after week, month after month, year after year. Members, this is a great bill that provides significant tax relief to the people of Minnesota. I urge a yes vote. The Secretary will take the roll on final passage of Senate File 3692. I call on Senator Herr to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Herr. Uh, Mr. President, I'd like to report nay for Senator Eaton. E Eaton votes no. Senator, uh, Senator Herr. Aye for Senator Eaton. Senator Eaton votes aye. Senator Herr. And nay for Senator Fateh. Senator Fateh votes nay. Thank you. I call on Senator Lang to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Lang. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Johnson votes yes. Johnson votes aye. Senator Lang. Senator Thomasoni votes yes. Thomasoni votes aye. Senator Lang. Senator Rosen votes yes. Rosen votes aye. Senator Lang. Senator Goggin votes yes. Goggin votes aye. Senator Kiffmeyer votes yes. And Senator Kiffmeyer votes aye. All members have voting uh, with the desire to vote. The secretary will close the roll. There being 42 ayes and 24 nays, Senate file 3692 does pass and its title agreed to. <laughs> Remaining under motions and resolutions, we will take up a third order. Of, I'm sorry. Senator. 
Senator Nelson. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. I move that we uh, put the bill on the table, waiting for that House Senator tax Nelson bill. moves to lay Senate File 3692 on the table. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, the motion does prevail. Now remaining under motions and resolutions, we'll take up the third order of business, messages from the House. Secretary will read the message. Mr. President, I have the honor to announce the adoption of the House of the following Senate concurrent resolution here with return, Senate concurrent resolution 16, a resolution relating to the adjournment for more than three days. Patrick D. Murphy, Chief Clerk, House of Representatives. No action is required on that message. Secretary will read the next message. Mr. President, I have the honor to announce that the House refuses to concur in the Senate amendments to House File Number 3420, a bill for an act relating to drought relief, modif drought relief modifying the disaster recovery loan program, increasing funding. The House respectfully requests that a conference committee of five members be appointed thereon, Sundin, Vang, Hanson R., Eklund, and Anderson have been appointed to such committee of the House. House File Number 3420 is here for herewith transmitted to the Senate with the request of the Senate appointed like committee. Patrick D. Murphy, Chief Clerk, House of Representatives. Senator Westrom. Mr. President, uh, I move that we accede to the House request to appoint a conference committee for HF 3420 and that we appoint a five-member conference committee from the Senate. To that motion, all in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, the motion does prevail. Senator Miller. Thank you, Mr. President. I move for a brief recess for the purpose of appointing a conference committee. The Senate is in recess. Senate will come to order. Senator Miller. Thank you, Mr. President. Is there a privilege report at the desk? There is. The Secretary will read the report. Senator Miller from the Subcommittee on Conference Committees recommends that the following senators be and they hereby are appointed as a conference committee on House File Number 3420, Senators Westrom, Weber, Lang, Dames, and Eakin. Senator Miller moves that the foregoing appointments be approved. To, on that motion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, the motion does prevail. Moving to the 13th order of business, announcements of Senate interest. Without objection, the following senator will be excused, be excused from today's session, Senator Pappas. Any further announcements? Senator Miller. Uh, thank you, Mr. President and members. Uh, I hope that everyone has some time to enjoy uh, family and friends and neighbors uh, during the Easter, Easter Passover break. Uh, with that, I move that the Senate do now adjourn until Tuesday, April 19th at 12 noon. To that motion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed? Aye. The motion does prevail. The Senate is adjourned. <laughs>